Welcome to the Newsome MMA podcast, partnered with Concussion Pro One, the world's first dedicated concussion supplement. I'm your host, as always, Newsome, with my co host, John, and tonight we're going to be breaking down UFC Fight Night 142 in Adelaide, Australia. John, how are you doing tonight, bro? I'm very well, thank you, mate. Very well. Uh, in the midst of a, uh, a UFC epidemic at the moment with all the uh, the cards that they're putting on, so as always, good to talk some fights. Listen, we were saying to people the amount of content that's going to be coming up between like now and Christmas, and this week's been a, an absolute killer for you know <laughs> tape study and recording podcasts and yeah, you know man. all this sort of stuff. But um, you know it's the sport we love, and we won't have it any exactly. other way. Exactly. So just before we start, I'd just like to remind you all that the Premium Bets membership options from Newsom MMA are available and on the Newsom MMA website. You have the options of a standard bronze, silver and gold membership and these memberships provide cheaper prices per fight card for those that commit to slightly longer terms opposed to purchasing my picks individually per week. You can find all these membership options at newsommma.co.uk forward slash premium hyphen bets. So without further ado, let's break down UFC Adelaide and from bottom to top in the first fight of the night, we've got Elias Garcia versus Kaikara France, a short notice fight that's been put together. John, who have you got in this one? Uh, yeah, this is a um, this is a really good fight actually, a fight that I'm really looking forward to. I was um, I was quite upset um, that the UFC didn't sign Kaikara France uh, after his stint on uh, The Ultimate Fighter, uh, although he did... Um, lose to Pantoja in that um, in that season. He um, he's one of those guys at flyweight that he's exciting. He he puts people away. He has got uh, one punch knockout power, which uh, you don't very often see from some of the uh, the flyweights. So I was I was quite surprised actually that they didn't uh, they didn't pick him up and and utilise him a bit sooner. And now obviously they've they've brought him in and they look like they're going to disband the uh, the weight class. So it's all a bit. Um, we seem to talk about this every <laughs> every podcast now. What what are these flyweights going to do? I hope um, I hope he stays with the UFC. I don't know whether um, I don't know that he's. I think he's fought at bantamweight previously, so I'm, I'm, I wouldn't surprise me if he if he moves up to bantamweight. But but yeah, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of um, of Kai Carl France. So I was upset to see um, to, to see the UFC didn't pick him up after his stint on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, like I mentioned, he, he he's heavy handed. He he throws bombs. He um, he, he likes to attack with that big overhand right. Uh, he mixes up body shots nicely as well. Uh, and he's going up against Garcia again, another exciting guy. We saw him. Um, we saw him quite recently actually against uh, Mark De La Rosa, and um, that, he, he lost that fight by uh, by rear naked choke in the second round. But that was a fun fight. That was exciting. He um, he'll throw caution to the wind. He, he was throwing Superman punches, mixing up kicks, high, low. Um, so I think this is going to be a really exciting fight to open things up. Uh, I do think that, uh, that Kai Kara France is going to get the win in this one. Um, what, what I did notice about Garcia in the, uh, the De La Rosa fight is he, he did occasionally get backed up against the fence. I think if he does that against Kara France, he's putting himself in trouble. Um, like I said, Carl, Carl France has got those uh, cinder block hands for the flyweight division. And I, I just like the way he mixes up his punches. He, uh, he he comes from a kickboxing background. I think this is going to be played out mostly on the feet. Um, if it does go down to the ground, I think Garcia does have the uh, the slight advantage. Uh, I did like it when, when De La Rosa took him down in the first round of their fight. He he, um, he tried to lock on that rubber guard and he, he looked like he was working for... Um, for submissions and, and, and good positions to try and lock on a submission, uh, so I do, I do think he he will um, he'll have the advantage if it does go to the ground. But I, I think it's going to stay standing for most of the fight, and I think uh, I think Car France is is the better striker, and he, he will outstrike uh, Garcia. Um, whether he puts him away, I don't know. Um, De La Rosa hit hit. Um, Hit Garcia with some some hard shots in their fights, but uh, Delos doesn't hold the kind of power that Cara France does. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if it went went to a decision. Um, but again, it, it wouldn't surprise me if we also saw saw a late uh, a late stoppage. Uh, but I'm going with uh, Cara France in this one. I, I think it will go the distance. I think it's going to be a decision win. Um, yeah, Kai Cara France for this one. Yeah, I I agree. I think it's going to be a really fun fight and. Um, remember, Al- uh, Elias Garcia is the uh, is the cousin of the Pettis brothers, Anthony and Sergio. So um, yeah. he's got that sort of uh, really fluid, um, really elusive sort of striking game. Um, I wouldn't say he's a carbon copy of either of them, but you can tell there's the shades of that in his game now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, o- I I almost feel that we we didn't see 
even 50% of, of what Garcia is capable of in his debut because Mark De La Rosa um, obviously had the the game plan to back him up to get the fight to the mat and to submit, and to submit him, which eventually he did in the second round. Yeah. Whereas that's not going to be Kaikara France's as game plan. Kaikara France is going to be um, wanting to get in his face. He's going to want to trade in the pocket. He's going to be wanting to throw heat. Um, you know, the small guys, they've both got good cardio. So um, I think it's going to be a really, really fun fight. Now the fight will be determined. The, the fight winner will be determined where, these guys trade um, standard in the striking department because I think if uh, if this fight goes down predominantly in in the boxing range in, in bo- boxing distance I think that Kai Kara France has got Elias Garcia's number all day in this spot. Yeah. But I think if uh, if Garcia can gauge some distance and. Uh, sort of be on the back foot a little bit, uh, angle off and just stay at kicking range, then I think that's where his game is really going to flourish. So really it all depends for me how uh, Kai approaches this fight because he's going to be the one that decides um, whether it takes place in in kicking range or in boxing range because yeah. if he decides if he decides not to close the distance and get in the pocket then he's allowing that kicking game to to start and i think that's where he is going to be deficient in this fight but um it's not it's not kai kara france's style to to stay at kicking range and to fight on the outside he likes to get inside he likes to get in close um and he, he he tends to have a lot of success in doing that as well he is really good at closing the distance and fighting inside the pocket so like I say, I I ultimately think that, that that's where the fight's going to go down, and for those reasons, that's why I think Kai Kara France is going to going to win. And uh, yeah, I I do think he stops Elias Garcia. I can see him getting in there. I can see him uh, landing some hard shots, maybe a little later on in the fight. So it could be a fine line between that finish and, and a decision. But yeah, I'm going Kai Kara France to win via TKO. And then in the next fight of the night, two newcomers. We've got Damir Ismagulov versus Alex Gorgiz. Who have we got in this one, John? Uh, yeah, this is um, this is an interesting fight. Obviously, we were um, I think we were meant to see Ross Pearson against Joe Duffy. Um, fight that I was, I was looking forward to. I like both those guys. And then then Pearson pulled out, and we we um, we had Isma Gulov brought in as a as a replacement. And then Duffy pulled out, and uh, and now we see uh, Alex Gorgies come in. Um, I'll be honest, I, I haven't seen a great deal of the two of them. I've probably seen more of uh, Isma Gulov. Um, from his uh, time in M1, uh, the M1 lightweight champion, and and he's riding one hell of a, uh, a win streak at the moment, dating back to uh, to 2015, um, about 10 or 11 victories. Um, from what I've seen of Gorgies, he, he looks like an interesting character. Um, he, he he's brash, he's cocky, he's um, he's happy to stand there and trade. I I, I watched his last fight against uh, guy Raphael Scott um, in Hex Fighting Series. Uh, I watched that fight. That was his, his only fight, I think, of his professional career that went to a decision. But he was, um, yeah, I mean, he was <laughs> he was doing some crazy stuff in there. He, he, he likes to throw kicks. He likes to throw spinning back fists. He was he, was, he definitely throws caution to the wind. He's uh, like I say, he's, he's brash and cocky. When uh, when Scott tried to um, tried to lock on a knee bar, he was just uh, he was just giving him the middle finger while he was attempting to lock on the submission. He, uh, yeah, he, he looks like a very interesting character and uh, he, it's going to be a quite an interesting fight. He's only young, 23 years old, um, fighting out of an Australian top team, I believe. Yeah. But, um, like I, said, I, have, I haven't seen a great deal of him and I, I, uh, I say this again, week in, week out, when we have newcomers come in, what what kind of level of competition has he been facing? Um, I think Ishma Gulov will... Um, have the, I think he's a, uh, from a Kazakhstani background. I think he's, he, from what I've seen, he's uh, he's got one punch knockout power as well. Um, I think he can take the uh, the fight to the to the mat as well, and uh, and that's what I think he'll do. I think he might uh, have the wrestling advantage. I think he might take Gorgies down. I think he might um, ground and pound him and eventually uh, get a stoppage win. So I'm I'm going with uh, Ishmagulov in this one with uh, the second round TKO finish. Yeah, I'm I'm the same as well, and I also think it's going to be a fun fight. Now, for yeah, me, definitely. I think I think there's a there's a clear um, there's a clear gap in the technical striking. So for a start, though, they are both really wild. They're both uh, wing punchers, and yeah. um, they both sort of 
don't have too much concern for for the striking defense, which is great for a fan to watch. <laughs> but I think when when it when it does come to the technical, uh, the slightly technical stuff, and I think is Magulov. Um, is is just far better. Uh, I think he's uh, more accurate. I think he's more aggressive. Uh, both these guys predominantly like to uh, strike moving forward. So for me, it's almost a question of, well, who's going to be the aggressor because they're not both. It's, ve- it's very rare that you see two fighters just decide to meet in the middle and just bang it out. And um, I think that one of these guys is, is going to be pushing the other one backwards. So when you ask yourself that question and... Um, I, I I ultimately think that it's going to be Ismagulov going to be the aggressor. I think he's going to be the one that's going to be throwing um, slightly the more heat. I think if he hits Gorgies earlier on, I think Gorgies will realise that power and that's when I think he'll start backing off a bit. And I think if Gorgies is the one fighting on the back foot, I, I'm not sure that he's going to, that's going to favour him at all. And I think that Ismagulov will just carry on putting the pressure on and just force the fight into uh, an area that Gorgies isn't comfortable in. Um, in regards to a ground game, I've not really seen too much of uh, Gorgies' ground game. Uh, we have seen some of his Magulovs, <laughs> though. He's not your typical, um, he's not your typical Dagestani-born Russian, you know. Um, he doesn't uh, hammer those uh, those takedowns that relentless style but he does have yeah. some nice trips from clinch so um, if Gorgie's is moving backwards striking and um, it's a little bit too much for him and Ismagulov gets close and he decides to tie up just to you know have a bit of a breather I don't think he's going to get that breather because I think Ismagulov can can get a trip and put him onto the mat and we've seen some nice ground and pound from Ismagulov as well I ultimately like I say I can't I can't look past an Ismagulov winning this fight I mean it wouldn't <clears throat> it wouldn't shock me so much if Gorgi is beaten because um they both are wild and we know this sport well and all it takes is that one shot. So it wouldn't surprise me so much if Gorgie's won, but if he did win, then it has to be um, that flash finish because I, I just don't see him uh, accumulating volume or um, just dominating the fight in a, in a fashion where he can win it on the scorecards if it was to hit the scorecards. But I've got Ismagulov to win this fight and I've got him to knock Alex Gorgie's out. Then in the next fight of the night, we've got Keita Keitaro Nakamura returning against Salim Tuahari. Who have you got in this one, John? Uh, yeah, we've seen the, um, seen the return of uh, the legend Nakamura, um, 34 years old, and he's got some crazy amount of fights coming up to odd, about 50-odd fights um, nearly now in his, uh, in his career. So he's coming towards the back end of his career. Uh, he's, he's lost two of his last three, so he'll be... Um, He'll be desperate to get a win in this one over uh, Tuhari. Um, we saw him make his debut. Uh, I think he was short notice against Wally Alves. Um, he looked okay. Uh, he, he striking looked okay. He likes to um, fire out the jab and uh, that um, that check hook as well. He was he was looking for that check hook over and over again, but he was a bit wild with it. He wasn't um, wasn't particularly crisp. He was, uh, was quite loopy and and. Um, yeah, whether that was uh, just down to the fact he's he coming in on short notice and he was, um, and yeah, he hadn't had a chance to, to sharpen his uh, his tools ahead of the fight. I'm not sure, but um, but yeah, I, I like Nakamura for this one. Um, I think he's got a distinct advantage uh, on the ground. He's a, he's a good solid um, jiu-jitsu black belt, um, and uh, and I think that's where he he will stand out in this fight. Um, Tuhari got taken down by Alves uh, a few times. Uh, Alves took the back a couple of times, although uh, Tuhari did manage to, to scramble out and escape quite nicely. Um, Nakamura's deadly when he when he gets you back, and he's got a number of rear naked choke wins. He's got about 10, 11 rear naked choke wins on his on his record. Uh, so if the fight goes into similar positions, which I think it will do. I think at some point in the fight, Nakamura will be able to, to get this down to the ground and, and I think he will take the back and, uh, and eventually lock on a rear naked choke. So, so I think he will get the win. Um, but yeah, I, I think Nakamura's tightened up on his striking as well. He's quite limited in his striking, but he has tightened up over the last few years. Um, obviously you saw him against, uh, against my guy, Tom Breeze, um, a couple of years back in uh, in London, and um, 
way in a fight that, that he lost. But uh, yeah, he. I think he. I think he will win. I think he. I think he will manage to take it down to the uh, the mat at some point, and I think he will get the um, the finish. I, I do think he'll he'll get a rear naked choke, add another one to his record. Um, I think it could be quite late in the fight. Uh, I think he's going to have to work for the takedowns. I think he's going to have to back uh, to Ari up against the uh, the cage before he gets those takedowns because that's where uh, to Ari seemed to, to struggle the most against uh, against Wally Alves. But ultimately, I do think um, I do think our, our man Kataro is going to uh, going to get the win and uh, get back in the win column. Yeah, and for me, I, I almost feel that this is a, a really smart fight for uh, Nakamura to take because yeah. I do feel that he's on the decline. He's 34 years old. Um, I think in, in each one of his fights, he's looking slightly more limited, whether it be him winning or whether it be him losing. I, I do think that he's looking more and more limited each time that we see him. Yeah. But having said that, he is facing good competition. So um, in his last fight, Anthony Rocco Martin, which we'll talk about a little yeah. bit later on, uh, Alex Morono, uh, Zaleski Dos Santos, Kyle Noak, Tom Breeze, Lee Jingliang. You know, he's he's fought some good guys. Yeah, he's, tough guys. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He's never he's never ha- he's never took a, a an easy route. But having said that. Like I say, I, I think he's slowing down a little bit. Um, I think he's, for some reason, he stopped being uh, so forceful on his takedowns as well, which is is really is really scary to see because that's where he's best. And like yeah. you mentioned, he's got a lot of rear naked chokes. He's a specialist. Um, at that once once he gets you back, the chances are that the fight is is going to end, or he he knows that he's got you back, and he'll just do it again, and the fight will end in a different moment. Um, really clever with the way that uh, he doesn't sink his hooks in either. He always leaves uh, leaves one of his hooks out to be able to uh, maneuver and transition a little bit slicker, yeah. a little bit easier. Should uh, should his opponent start to um, sort of defend the chokes really well, but. With with uh, with Salim, I just feel that um, again he's he, I wouldn't say he's limited, but he's uh, he, he's a he's a round well rounded fighter. So he's not specifically great in any specific area. Um, he's just okay everywhere, and because of that, I don't think he, he packs a lot of volume in uh, in his striking. Yeah. Um, on the mat again, he's okay, but he's not going to want to go to the mat with uh, Nakamura. Here. I think Nakamura that well, that's where the biggest gap in in skill is in this fight for sure. Yeah. Um, but to beat someone like Nakamura striking, you've got to apply that volume because we saw in the Alex Morono fight. And bear in mind when Alex Morono fought Nakamura, and you compare to what we saw Morono last week in Beijing, yeah. you know yeah. that that's two different. They almost look like two different fighters, uh, yeah. minus the additional hair that <laughs> now got on top of his head. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it almost looked like a completely different fight because in that fight last week in Beijing, Morono packed volume. He was aggressive. He came forward. He was angling well. He was uh, his striking defense was on point. His entire game, he looked really good in that fight. But then you look back at the Nakamura fight, and he, like I say, he, he was plodding. He, he didn't want to engage, and it, <clears throat> I almost feel that this fight is going to go. Uh, a similar way to that of uh, Alex Mar- of Nakamura and Alex Morono. Um, yeah. The problem that I've seen for Salim is when he's taken down against the cage, he shows his back, and he, yeah, I've, I've seen him do that on multiple occasions. I'm telling you now, if he shows his back against Nakamura, it's going to be over shortly after that because, um, like I say, that that gap in skill is ridiculously huge as it is. But then you've got a specialist of uh, of of being on. Uh, somebody's back and, and choking them out so I agree with you um, I do think it's it, it, Nakamura's one to watch in the future in regards to potentially fading the guy because I, I genuinely think he's, he's on a decline, it's very slow but I, I find it quite obvious when watching tape but for this fight I don't think it's going to matter, I've got Keita Nakamura to win via rear naked choke and then in the next fight of the night we've got Mizuto Hirota versus Christos Giagos who have we got in this one John? Uh, yeah, this is um, this is a fight that both guys will uh, will desperately be, be looking to win. Um, both guys in their uh, second stint in the UFC. Um, Hirota back-to-back losses against Ross Pearson and uh, Alexander Volkanovski, and uh, and 
and uh, Giagos, he, he, he came in for uh, for his return against Charles Oliveira. We spoke about that fight only a, a couple of months ago. Um, we're praising um, Giagos for, for, for what he's done and what you have to do to get back into the UFC. You need to get back in there, um, fight on the, the, the regional scene, uh, fight frequently and, and get wins, and that's what he did. He had, um, he had a number of fights in a, in a short period, um, getting out there for, for all kinds of promotions, ACB, RFA, um, number of uh, number of different promotions. And I thought he was um, he looked good in the first round against Oliveira as well. Uh, I know he, he, he went on to lose that fight in the second round by a rear naked choke. But um, but he looked decent. I, he, he was he striking. He was, I don't know whether it was because he was concerned about Oliveira's takedowns and, and obviously the submission threat that Oliveira then posed. But he was very... Um, reliant on the, the, the one two, the straight shots and he kept it quite tight with his um with his striking, just not really utilising anything other than the, the, the jab and the straight, but um he was constantly moving. Uh sometimes he got caught um uh, with just lateral movement and he, he wasn't circling out after striking, so he, he got caught with his, his back against the cage, um which uh which led to Oliveira landing a few takedowns but Ultimately, I, I, I was quite impressed with uh, with Yargos in the first round, and I thought he may have um, he may just have pinched the first round. He, he, he was quite a close round. Now Oliveira ended up in the mount towards the end, but he was a pretty close round up until that point. Um, he wrote as a guy uh, you just mentioned um, in the, in the previous side, Nakamura, who's who's on the decline. He, he's 37 years old now. Um, he lost his last fight to a. Uh, to Ross Pearson, who who's not a Ross Pearson of five or six years ago either. He's he's lost some of his pop and some of his speed, and he desperately needed a win. Um, I think Giagos is going to have too much in this in this fight for Hirota. I think he's just going to pick him off on the feet. I think he's uh, going to land more volume, outstrike him, um, just out pressure him. I think whenever uh, Hirota moves in, I, I, I think. Um, I think Iago is going to be able to evade his strikes quite easily. Um, now the Hirota slowed down, yeah, and I think um, I think Iago is just going to going to pick him off on the feet. I I don't think he'll finish him. Um, Hirota is still quite tough to finish. I mean, uh, he hasn't been finished hardly at all in his career. I think he's only been finished once in his career, so he's still tough. Um, he he's still got durability, but uh, like I said, I think he'll just get picked up, picked apart on the feet, and I think uh, I think we're going to see a comfortable uh, one-sided decision to uh, Giagos in this one. For sure, and um, just a just a quick one for anybody that's uh, you know maybe new to watching MMA or um, you know anything like that. This Christos Giagos is the exact example of what to do as a fighter when you cut from the UFC. Because yeah. he came into the UFC, he lost to Gilbert Burns, he beat Jorge Antonio, Cesario, Di Oliveira. He lost then to Chris Wade. So he was one and two in the UFC and he got cut. But rather than, you know, sulking and having to go back to the regionals and potentially thinking, you know, you're never going to get that other opportunity, he went straight in there again in the WFC and uh, he got knocked out against Josh Emmett. But if you watch that fight, it was a really, really fun fight. Every yeah. single fight since he's been cut from the UFC has been an, a, a really, really good fight to watch. He yeah. hasn't had a boring fight. He's been in the fights. He's, st- he's stood, he's banged, he's grappled, he's, he's submitted, you know. He, every, everything that the guy's done since he's been cut w- was just nothing short of brilliant. And yeah. he's rightfully got that call back up to the UFC. And he took that call back up to the UFC on short notice against Charles Oliveira. <laughs> Oliveira as well, yeah. <laughs> which I think he actually looked really good in. And I'm happy for the guy because I do think that he's going to be able to get a run in the UFC right now. Um, you I, honestly, you don't see many people looking that good against Oliveira sort of outside the top 15, especially on short notice, especially on your return for the UFC. Those gyms yeah. will have been there all over again for him as well. So oh, of course, yeah. For anybody wanting to know how to react and how to go about getting uh, returning to the UFC from getting cut, then take a leaf out of this dude's book. Now, on the flip side, I think this is a horrible fight for... Um, uh, for Hero here, you know he's he's one four and one in the UFC um, <laughs> with that only win coming against Cole Miller. Now this is yeah. <clears throat> this is also a road to second stint in the UFC. So he lost to um, Hani Yaya, which 
is absolutely not by no means a bad loss at all. No. Then he lost to Rodrigo Dam. He got cut. He came back uh, for Teruto Ishihara, which was a really, really good fight, by the way. Um, that ended up being a draw. Then he beat Cole Miller. Then he lost to uh, Volkanovski. Again, you can't really put too much stock into into that loss. But then the big telling one for me was the one you mentioned with Ross Pearson. This is 2018 yeah. Ross Pearson. I'm a big yeah. fan of the uh, of Pearson. I have been for years. But listen, this is the fight game. It's unforgiving. And uh, everybody comes to a point where no matter how good you were, you just decline. And it's just like any yeah. sport. You know, you come to your end of your shelf life doing what you love and it is what it is and that's where Ross Pearson is at the minute yet Ross Pearson although he Pearson did get uh knocked down momentarily Pearson comfortably won the fight in my opinion out out volumed her outer and looked good against him but Christos Giagos man is going to have uh, a height advantage he's going to have uh, a physical advantage he's going to have a strength advantage he's the better striker he's quicker he's uh, he can fight in the pocket. He can fight at range. Uh, he's got takedowns himself. He's got a, a brief wrestling background. Um, his top side grappling's good. His bottom side grappling is very good as well. You know, he made it out of the first round against Charles Oliveira, who did yeah. take him down in that first round. So <clears throat> I honestly thought in that fight, the second that Oliveira gets that takedown, it's going to be over from there unless he doesn't have time to work. But Oliveira did get that first takedown. He did have time to work and he couldn't get him out of there straight away. Yeah, no, no. I listened to an interview with uh, Giagos today and um, he was talking about how he, how he made a mistake and tried to rush too much in that second round. He, he did panic um, because he was out in the open um, with, on the bottom against Oliveira. He tried to rush up to his feet too quick and then got his uh, you know, got his back taken. Um, yeah. And that's all she wrote from there. But yeah, I, I honestly think this is a, a horrible matchup for her. To like you also mentioned, he's 37 years old. He's not getting any better. He is declining. Whereas I think Christos Giagos is a solid dude. I don't think he's going to be a guy that um, that breaks the top 10. He may get into the top 15 if, if he drastically improves. Remember, he's, he is only 28, so he's hitting his prime now. If he goes on a run of, you know, two or three fights, uh, two or three wins in a row, then he could be sort of breaching around that time uh, around that top 15 who knows but you know in in the fight itself fighting question I think he's going to have too much for Herota. I'm I'm not sure where Herota, um does have any advantages I think his path to victory in this fight would be potentially um pocket trying to pocket box with um with Giagos getting inside and just trying to land but then I just think in in that scenario Giagos hits harder and like I say he's faster as well so um yeah, from a stylistic point of view, I do struggle to see uh, where Herota has too many advantages in this fight. And I also feel a little bit sorry for Herota in regards to his physique and his, his weight class because he is one of those fighters, and we do see them from time to time, that are just stuck between uh, between two weight divisions. I think he's too small for 155. Um, whereas Giagos, by the way, could easily fight at 170 if he wanted to and not look out of place. But then I think Herota is too small for 145. You know, he nearly killed himself trying to trying to weigh in to fight at Charles Rosa. So, um, yeah, I just I, I think a lot of things don't add up here for for Herota. And I think uh, I think Giagos is going to be the first person to knock him out. I think the volume throughout the the first and potentially second round is uh, is going to add up. I think he's going to start hurting Herota, and I think Herota is just going to break inside the cage. So I've got Chris Ask Giagos to win, and I've got him to win via knockout. Then in the next fight of the night, we've got again another really interesting fight, man. I love this card. We've got Wilson Hayes <laughs> versus Ben Engin. So who have you got in this one, John? Uh, yeah, this is one that I've been um, I've been going back and forward over, and I'll, I'll probably just uh, <laughs> decide uh, who I'm going to pick to win during this uh, <laughs> during this little five minutes of, uh, nice. of talking about it. But um, no, I have thought about it in, in a bit more detail than that. But it it, it was a tough decision, and um, and yeah, this is a fight between uh, between two, two good guys, two exciting guys. Um, Wilson Hayes is a guy that's that's been around for a long time, 33 years old. He's um he's in MMA terms, he's not particularly old, but in the flyweight division and um and he's had a, a, a large number of fights. He's had over 30 fights in his career. He's uh, he is slowing down now, and uh, again, someone that I think will be tailing off in the next few years. Um, Ben 10 um is is an exciting fighter. He uh. He, he shot to fame with that um, that fight back in 
I think it was it Australia or New Zealand where he, where he fought against the guy with all the tattoos on his face and uh, he, he was getting all up in his face and uh, and it went viral on uh, on social media. He was getting all up in uh, Ben Ten's face and uh, and Ben Ten knocked him out early on in that fight. And um, was that Ben Ten that fight? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. If I, I didn't uh, know if that. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was uh, it was Ben Ten. Yeah, if I, well, you learn something the, uh, every day, don't you? Yeah, I'll have to uh, I'll have to try and find the fight. It was um, I can remember it. I know exactly. I know exactly which fight that, that that you're talking about. The one that went viral. I just had no idea that was Ben Ten. I, th- I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I'm pretty pretty certain it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going back to the fight itself, uh, it, it's an exciting fight. Uh, ben Ten. I like the guy. Um, he's dangerous on the mat. As we know, he, he he's he's good on his feet. He's pretty good all round um, all round fighter. He's, he did lose his last fight to, to Formiga, but there's there's no um, there's no shame in that. Formiga's a, a top guy at, at flyweight. He's a very dangerous guy. He lost that fight in the third round by rear naked choke. Formiga just dominated with the takedowns and um, and, and, and top control, but. In the fight before that, he, he he defeated a very dangerous Tim Elliott via rear naked choke. Tim Elliott himself is is a pretty um, a good submission guy, so to get pick up a submission win over him so um so early on in the first round, fantastic achievement. Um, Wilson Hayes, he's, like I say, he's on the decline. He's lost his last three now. Um, obviously that title fight to Demetrius Johnson, uh, then he lost to to Henry Cejudo and, and most recently John Moraga. Um, Hayes is he. he his bread and butter is on the uh, on the on the mat. He, he, if he can get the fight to the ground and he can start working his jiu-jitsu, he, he, his top control, um, that's where he will want this fight to be. Um, this is where he'll want this fight to play out. And um, I think he's going to do it. I think he's going to get back into the win column. Uh, I think he will be able to take uh, Ben Ten down. And uh, and when he gets him down, I know Ben Ten does pose a, a, a submission threat and. Uh, and he's dangerous off his back, but I think uh, I think Ace he's a, he's a very solid uh, black belt, and um, I think he'll be able to to withstand any any uh, any submission attacks from the bottom, and I think he'll be able to to just rack up the um, rack up the rounds in the judges' eyes, and I think he will um, he, he will take the the decision win. Um, so no, it's going to be a very close fight. I wouldn't be surprised at all if. Um, if Ace does struggle to get the takedowns, we've seen that he does fade. Uh, and if Ben Ten can can keep his standing, I think he wins. I think he's a better striker. Um, and yeah, I, I think Ace will will fade if he if he can't get those takedowns. He can't get them early. Um, the key for Ace is to to set up the takedowns rather than just just uh, shooting in naked. But um, but yeah, ultimately, I, I do think Wilson Hayes is going to win this. I think he's going to be able to get it to the ground, and uh, like I say, I think he's going to um, he's going to be able to keep it there and and just rack at the um, the points and, and and take a decision win. Man, you love throwing these curveballs because it happened <laughs> it happened in in the Buenos Aires card that we broke down, uh, where you're completely going in on one guy, and I'm thinking, okay, well you're picking the other guy, and then you suddenly <laughs> swing around and pick the other guy. So, um, yeah, I was going to disagree a lot with you until you made your final pick, and I'm still going to disagree with some of the stuff you've said respectfully, of course. Now, um, Wilson Hayes, I think it's uh, a common theme that people are saying. So you're not the only one that is on a decline and is slowing down, and this, that, and the other. And honestly. Honestly, man, I I don't see that at all. I get that he's old um, for the division and he's old in the fight game as well, but I don't see any obvious signs of decline. Now, the John Moraga fight, that's a tough fight, man, for anybody. I mean, look at uh, Magomed Bibilatov, who went in there against John Moraga as a minus 400 favourite and got knocked out in round one. And that's, yeah. that's a guy that a lot of people were tipping to be the top of the division at some point. And um, you know, the point is John Moraga's a, a good striker, he's a good counter striker as well, which is also very, very key to fighting Wilson Hayes because Wilson Hayes puts the pressure on. So you have to be able to fight on the counter, you have to be able to fight on the back foot. And having that uh, lead check uh, left hook as well is is perfect for, for Moraga in, in that sort of fight. So I think stylistically, Wilson Hayes was... Um, not in a great fight against Moraga. Having said that, though, I've watched the fight back now three times, and I think Wilson Hayes won the fight. I was I was a bit unsure. I think watching it live, uh, well, not in attendance, but watching it as it was happening, um, I think I did score it to Moraga. But watching it back a couple more times, Wilson Hayes won that fight, in my opinion. And you look at his 
uh, two fights before that, the now champion in Henry Cejudo that would be everybody else in that division, the then champion Demetrius Johnson, who was the greatest of all time at, the, uh, at that point in fighting. Nobody could beat the dude. So those two losses against the top of the division, and then, in my opinion, it wasn't a robbery, but I still think that Wilson Hayes beat John Moraga. Those are three really, really tough fights, and I, you can't take anything you cannot take anything from the Henry Cejudo fight and the Mike Mouse fight because the Mike Mouse fight, he did what he did to everybody. Henry Cejudo finished him um, quite early on. But if you remember, Henry, that was Henry Cejudo's first fight where he came out in this new karate stance and surprised everybody. So what the fuck do you think Wilson Hayes is going gonna, is gonna <laughs> to think when he's staring down at the guy and he comes out like that? He'll just be thinking, shit, well, I didn't. I didn't plan for this in, you know, in my in my training camp, and then he knocked him out, and then people were like, oh, well, is his chin gone? Well, I saw him cracked quite a lot of times hard by Moraga, so I don't think his chin is anywhere near, anywhere near done. Um, then moving on to to Ben Ten again, I like the I like the guy, but another common misconception with Ben Ten is people think he's this young, um, this young up and coming prospect that could potentially do great things in in the division or. The division that was but the guy's yeah. 30 and he's had, <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, he's, 30 and he's had 23 <laughs> fights himself he's, he's not young um he's past he, you know he i know he's uh um wilson hayes is 33 but they're both past the prime for the division and there's only three years difference between them so i think again that's another common misconception about ben 10 now from a stylistic point of view uh ben 10 does scramble well um, and I think the fight, I think he has to scramble well because I think the fight will hit the mat. Wilson Hayes will make sure of it. Ben Tenney is definitely the better striker. He's quicker. He's more accurate. But the problem is, he's stopping Wilson Hayes getting the takedowns. I mean, it, it, when when you when you analyse the wrestling game, and I believe I analyse uh, wrestlers and grapplers really well, uh, I think that's probably the strongest part of my analysis so i recognize some of the little things that wilson hayes does and he's really impressive but if that isn't enough to convince you just go back and watch that moraga fight with wilson hayes and just listen to daniel cormier he gets so excited talking about all the you know all the all these little these little qualities that wilson hayes has in his wrestling he gets so excited by it and it's very rare that you see dc get animated like that in in regards to commentating on on a specific fight so um yeah I, I, wilson hayes is a brilliant wrestler he finds ways to get to the mat he's gonna hit the mat uh unless ben 10 scores a flash knockout within the first 30 seconds and Ben Ten, like I say, scrambles well. He does. He does do a good job of scrambling. Um, I know you mentioned John that uh, he not uh, he submitted uh, Tim Elliott, and that was impressive. But the one thing to mention about that fight is he he hurt Tim Elliott really really yeah, badly, really, yeah. dropped him, and then jumped on him. And Tim Elliott, after the fight, said um, that for that final thirty seconds of the fight, he he didn't he can't remember it. He said he was out. He was basically fighting like unconscious even that doesn't yeah. <laughs> make sense but um you know what i mean and so he couldn't if he didn't know what was going on he couldn't defend anything and that's why ben 10 made it look so easy however for as good as a scrambler and a good of uh, a grappler and um a sweet reverse grappler as well you can see the point in every single fight where ben 10 has to has to scramble and the Louis Smolka fight is key for this. He can see the point where he realizes he's given it everything he possibly can. And there's no more to offer here. He's tried his best. He's tried to different various different escapes, various different ways to get back up to his feet. But you can all, you can honestly, I, I could pinpoint it for you in the Smolka fight. You can <laughs> almost see the look in his face at that very moment where he realizes shit, I've tried everything. And from there, I feel that yeah. he mentally breaks. He quits. And I don't like to say that about fighters, but you can, I've seen it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to pretend it's something it's not. And I think that the same thing's going to happen in this fight. I think Wilson Hayes is going to come out. I think he's going to come out wanting to take him down, get the fight to the mat. Um, He's not going to want to strike with him. I think Ben Ten's going to have a lot, of, a lot of success scrambling. But then Wilson Hayes has almost got that uh, Rani Yaya top game where he almost, he's, it's almost a magnet for him being on top. So wherever yeah. the fight will scramble, he'll get a hold of a single leg. Um, he'll, he'll reverse you. He'll, he'll pull you back down, throw, um, tap the knee, and you know he, he'll do anything that he has to do to get on top, and it almost, it's almost always successful. And I feel that that's 
it's going to be a carbon copy of what Smolka did to him, except I don't think Hayes is going to ground and pound him out. But yeah, I, I think that Ben Ten's going to do well. I think Wilson Hayes is going to do better. I think he's going to stay on top. Um, and yeah, I'd, I've got a funny feeling that Wilson Hayes will find, uh, he'll either find the back and he'll submit Ben Ten with a rear naked choke, or I feel that he'll just mount him and lock in an arm triangle. I've got a feel, funny feeling it's either going to be an arm triangle or it's going to be a rear naked choke. But I think Wilson Hayes is gonna is gonna submit Ben Ten. So yeah, I've got Wilson Hayes to win via submission. Then in the next fight of the night, we've got Yushin Akami, a very familiar name to us MMA mm, fans, definitely. versus Alexei Kunchenko. So who have you got in this one, John? Yeah. Um... Another uh, veteran. Seems like there's a lot of them on this card. Uh, Yushin uh, Thunder Okami. Um, obviously now he's fighting again at uh, welterweight. He, he came back to the UFC. Obviously he got released. Um, a lot of people thought at the time it was quite harsh when he got released because I think he he'd won three fights on the bounce. Then he lost to uh, to Jacare, which is um, there's no no shame at all in losing to uh, to Jacare. And then he got cut and. Um, and went over to World Series of Fighting, and he had a bit of a uh, difficult time over there. Only won one of his his three fights. Um, but again, he he fought against difficult opponents in uh, David Branch and John Fitch, uh, and then moved around a little bit, and um, and then managed to to work his way back to the UFC. He came in on uh, late notice, actually, against uh, well, I'm pretty sure it was the, was it the main event against uh, Arvin no Sempru? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, obviously. Unfortunately, we, he was obviously fighting up several weight classes as he's now fighting at uh, at welterweight, and that was at light heavyweight, and uh, he, he suffered um, the fate that many people do against uh, OSP, and that's uh, losing by uh, Von Fluchok. But got back in the win column against uh, Diego Lima uh, back in April. Um, great to see him get a win um, again in the UFC. I didn't think it's something that we'd see with him being 37 years old and, and away from the UFC for so long. Obviously, we know what he's about from his earlier days when he challenged for the middleweight title. He's got uh, good judo. He's got good power in his hands. Uh, I think he has lost some of that power as uh, as time's gone on. Um, but he's coming up against uh, a tough guy in Kunchenko. Kunchenko made his debut um, only uh, only in September against Thiago Alves. Uh, won a, quite a, a fairly comfortable decision. Just uh, just outstruck Alves throughout the fight. Another guy who's coming over from uh, from M1. Um, I don't want to use the word underwhelmed for for how I felt about him in his um, in his USC day because Thiago is uh, a tough guy, a veteran of the sport. Um, I don't really know what I was expecting, but obviously he, he's undefeated in uh, well, he was undefeated in 18 fights up until that point, and he was um, knocking people out regularly, stopping them, um, and. St- I don't know. I don't, like I say, underwhelmed's not the right word, but uh, I don't know if I was expecting more from him just because I'd, I'd, I hyped him up so much in my head. But it was a good, solid <coughs> performance in the UFC debut, like you say. Um, no matter who you are, under the, the the big bright lights of of the the premier mixed martial arts organisation, there's always going to be um, a touch of of uh, of jitters, octagon jitters, in your in your debut. But he uh, he he toughed a, uh, he passed the tough test with uh, against Thiago Alves, and uh, and I think this fight he's, he's going to go a similar way. I think he's going to uh, outstrike Akami. Uh, I think just with volume and pressure, I think he's going to back him up against the uh, the fence, which we saw him do against uh, against Alves, and and I think he might. Um, I think he might stop Akami late on in this fight. I think he'll uh, he'll just overwhelm him. I think um, eventually those the just the volume of strikes will will accumulate and and um, and take their take their toll on Akami. And I I could just see him uh, dropping in in possibly late second, third round, and um, and, and Kunchenko swarming and, uh, and and continuing his his perfect record at uh, taking it to twenty and I. Yeah, and. I almost, I, I, I sort of get where you're coming from in, in regards to thinking that it was potentially underwhelming against uh, Thiago Alves yeah. on his UFC debut. But, you know, you made a lot of great points as well. You know, it was his first uh, fight in the UFC. Um, of course, he was he was getting people for years and years. Well, I say of course. I would assume that he's, he's had critics over the, the last few years, sort of, when he was hitting the 15, 16 and 0, them turning around and saying, yeah, but, you know, what are you going to be like in the UFC? Are you going to have yeah. that? Period? So I'd imagine he'd have 
and he built it up a, uh, himself a lot uh, as well. But it wasn't an easy out for him. Thiago Alves, I wouldn't say he's, he was on a resurgence, but um, I don't think he he'll always be in a fight and he's technically yeah, gifted definitely. with his Muay Thai. So um, he's, he's always going to cause problems. And I don't think Thiago Alves looked that, that bad in that fight. Again, I just feel that, again, similar to what you said, we, we as fans and potentially the UFC as well built this guy up um, potent, where we were potentially thinking he's going to steamroll somebody like Thiago Alves, especially uh, when we saw what Curtis Millender did to Thiago Alves yeah, and put yeah. him out. You know, I think we almost felt that uh, we were using MMA math and thinking that Clinton <laughs> was going to run through him, but um, it wasn't to be. Still a solid performance, though, in my opinion, uh, standing up and striking with, like I say, a guy that's really gifted in, in regards to his Muay Thai. I think Definitely. Akami, though, is, is going to be in a lot of trouble in this fight because I, he, he won't be able to, to, to match Kunchenko in, in the striking department stood up. Taking him down might be a bit too much of an ask as well. I mean, you've got to remember Kunchenko is still a Russian. He's still going to have good takedown defence. He's still going to have good grappling. Um, and he does strike me as a guy that's going to be very, very hard to, to take down. How he looks on his back if he does get taken down is a bit of a red flag because we don't know. And we have seen Akami have um, a really smothering top game. We saw that in his last yeah. fight against Diego Lima, where he completely dominated the fight from um, from start to finish. So for Akami, he has to get this fight to the mat. He has to. But I just think it's going to be a difficult out for him because uh, I don't think... I think Kunchenko is going to be the aggressor. I think he's going to be the one coming forward, landing shots. But I just feel that... Um, he's not going to leave any real openings uh, or make any sloppy mistakes in his movement, which is going to allow Akami an easy takedown. And I ultimately think that's how Akami does get the fight to the mat by capitalising on uh, on a potential, um, you know, stance error. Maybe if he square, if he was to square his feet up, and at that point Akami shooting. But Kunchenko style, I don't think he's going to really give away um, any gifts in that respect. So. I agree with you. I think accumulation of, uh, of volume on, on a calm is going to end up uh, just taking its toll. And I think maybe, I think the first round is going to be really tough for a calm. And I think, I think when it goes, when it, when that bell ends after the first round, I think we're all going to be thinking to ourselves, yeah, he's probably going to be gone in the next round. And I think that's ultimately what we're going to see. So I've got Alexei Kunchenko to win this fight via TKO. Now, in the next fight of the night, we've got Suman Mokhtarian versus the newcomer Sadiq Youssef. Who have we got in this one, John? Yeah, this is a fight that I'm um, I'm quite excited to to watch as well. I was I was quite shocked when I um I looked at the lines for this one. Uh, Mokhtarian's a, a heavy underdog in this fight. Um, from from what I saw, um, but yeah, I think this could be um could be an interesting fight and one that I'm actually uh. Actually, quite looking forward to. I, I, I do like Mokhtarian. I, I like his story. I don't know if um, if people have seen his story with him and his brother. They've um, had their own personal battles in their life, and then uh, they've gone on to to pick one another up. And I think they've opened their own gym in uh, in Australia and things. It's a it's a really good story. Um, he, his brother was was also due to fight um, on this on this card as well. I think he was uh, the original opponent for for Kai Car of France. Um, yeah, we saw a little bit of uh, Mokhtarian in the uh, in the Ultimate Fighter. Um, I think he was the, uh, the, the Daniel Cormier and Steve Amiocic season. Um, I was a little underwhelmed. He, he, he just got outpointed by uh, by Ricky Steele in that fight. And uh, yeah, I was, I, I was expecting a bit more of him. Um, but if, if guys haven't seen um, much of... Mkhitaryan, uh please go look at YouTube because he's got some fantastic submission wins. Uh, he's one of very few guys to uh, get a win via Twister, uh, and he also uh, he could be the only guy um, who to win via uh, TP submission. I believe it was named. Um, I'm not sure if that was his last fight or not, but uh, but yeah, that was a, I think that, that was, was a crazy something like a, a baseball choke. Or something yeah, like yeah. That. Yeah, he was uh, he, he was he's one hell of a crazy submission, but he's a dangerous guy when this uh, when this fight hits the mat, and um, yeah, and he, he he's a tough guy. Uh, we we saw that he um, he's not afraid to to 
to stand there and, and, and trade and, and, and chase you down. We saw that in the uh, the Ultimate Fighter. He just got picked apart. Um, his opponent, um, Sadiq Super Yusuf, uh, I, I've only seen bits and bobs of this guy. I saw, uh, obviously, he fought against Mike Davis in the Contender Series. And, and then before that, he, he fought against a um, pretty good European prospect in uh, Dylan the Nuke Took. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that that fight from uh, from Brave back in March. Um, quite a lot of people saying it was an early stoppage. He did uh, he did land a, a big bomb on uh, on Dylan Took in that fight and 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 Took hit the mat, but he, he looked like he was st- still in it and he was working for a single leg uh, when the referee intervened. So I think that one could have been uh, could have been stopped quite early. But this guy looks like he possesses power. You can see that on his. Um, on his record, he's um, he's got quite a few finishes by uh, knockout and TKO. Um, but yeah, I think this this is an interesting fight. I do think uh, I think Yusuf will get the win uh, as long as he can keep the fight standing. I think Mataran does. He's uh, he's most dangerous on the ground with the submissions. Uh, if Yusuf can keep this fight standing, uh, from what I've seen of his striking, I think he, he he's a better striker and he's more dangerous. He holds more. Um, one punch power than uh, the Mukhtarin. I, I think Yusuf is going to come out of this with the win. Um, Mukhtarin is um, he, he's undefeated in his in his, his career, so it's it's hard to tell whether his um, his team will be able to withstand um, the hands of Yusuf. I think they will. I think it will go to a decision, um, but I think Yusuf will, will will do the more damage on the feet and and come out with the with the decision win in this one. Yes, yeah, yeah. I disagree with you. Um, with you saying that you were surprised with, well, not that you were surprised. That's your opinion, obviously, but um, saying that the the lines are so off because I don't think they're off. I think uh, Sadiq Yusuf is an absolute freak, and <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not saying Mok, uh, Mokhtarian's a, a bad fighter, um, but I just think Sadiq is just is something else, man. Like I was watching his fight against Mike Davis in the Contender series, and the heat that Sadiq throws yeah. <laughs> doesn't doesn't gas out like any other fighter on the planet would throw in that sort of heat is just it was just crazy crazy to see because yeah he slowed down towards the end of the fight but he didn't slow down so much that he was ever in any trouble or he was in danger or um he was struggling to keep up pace he was just slowing down naturally as fighters do in general but the dude was throwing absolute heat for seven and a half minutes so the the kid's a freak uh his gas <laughs> tank's ridiculous his power is also unbelievable fair play to to mike davis in that fight for, for taking those shots i know he got put down uh, a couple of times by them yeah. but i'm telling you now there's not many human beings on the planet that will that would stay standing after a few of those shots and I, I can assure you right now if he hits Mokhtarian with anything like it, what he hit Mike Davis with he's he's taking that canvas nap and he's going to sleep um interestingly though how I think that uh how I think he's going to finish this fight is how he nearly finished Mike Davis in in that fight and that's with the leg kicks um he did a lot of damage to the leg to the point where Mike Davis had to switch legs and he didn't switch back either. Like sometimes you'll see fighters in <clears throat> in fights that will get hit with a leg a few leg kicks, it'll start to hurt and they'll retreat, um, they'll switch stances, just give it a bit of a rest, and then they'll naturally switch back to, to their natural stance. Yeah. There was none of that with Mike Davis when he switched legs, he switched legs. In fact, I think he did change <laughs> back once and he got hit with another leg kick straight away and he was like, Nope, that was a bad decision um and reverted straight back to to the to the switching stance now with Mokhtarin he puts so much weight on that front leg on that lead leg when he's striking when he's moving forward everything well not everything but the majority of his balance and the majority of his weight distribution tends to be um on that front leg and if Sadiq notices that early and bear in mind the, the dude uses leg kicks you know that's in his arsenal um he does tend to use it in general anyway <clears throat> but if he specifically notices that which i assume he would because if i've noticed it why would a professional fight or not um it could be a short night with in, if he starts really tagging up those legs because he has got heavy, heavy leg kicks. I feel that uh, Mokhtarin's going to be in a world of hurt in this fight. And um, if he can get it to the mat and he can get top time, I think that's his best path to victory. But 
Sadiq's got good takedown defence. He's got a wrestling background as well. Um, he started wrestling from uh, a really young age. Well, not a really young age. I think it was like 14, 15 when he, he moved over to America or something along them sort of lines. So he, he's been he's been wrestling for a while. He's, he's, his wrestling background is definitely more extensive than anything Mokhtarian's got. But yeah. Mokhtarian needs to get this fight to the mat. And in his, uh, in his ultimate fighter fight against uh, Steele, you saw in that fight he was unable to get the fight to to the mat. You know, there was times where he had Steele pinned up against the cage, and he was he was, you know, maybe trying to feel out something, work for something, but he just couldn't do it. And Sadiq's a big physical dude as well, gets his underhooks really nicely against the cage, um, and he did that against uh, Mike Davis when Davis pinned him up. Broke from the clinch, angled out, and then off they went again. And I like I say I. <clears throat> I disagree in the fact that I I I I agree with the line and I agree and I understand why it's that wide. If Mokhtarian wins this fight, I would be very very surprised because I don't think he'll be able to eat uh, the leg kicks with how much pressure he puts on that front leg. I definitely think that once his chin's or if his chin's cracked with some of the shots that we saw him cracked against Mike Davis, I don't think his chin withstands. And I'm not. You know, I'm not saying anything detrimental towards Mokhtarian. I just think that if you crack anybody with that sort of power, <laughs> like Mike Davis must have had iron in that chin or something. I I don't know, but he got hit a few times. The other side to it as well is Mike Davis was also landing heat on him, landing hard body kicks, landing good counters on, on Sadiq. Sadiq's not hittable, but... Uh, well, sorry, of course he's hittable. He's not... Um, he's not overly hittable. It's not as if his, his striking defense is really bad, but yeah. um, Mike Davis was still landing some heavy strikes uh, on his chin and it just didn't phase him whatsoever. I just think the dude has got crazy cardio. He's got, he's durable as fuck. He hits hard. He's, uh, he's, he's striking. He's, is so technical. He mixes in leg kicks with combinations. He fights amazingly going forward. He's got absolutely no issue striking, moving backwards as well. Doesn't care if his back's against the cage. I think he's got good takedown defense. I just, I'm, I'm excited about this guy. I think, I, I genuinely think he's going to be one to watch um, moving forward in, in the UFC for sure. So I think he's going to finish it by leg kicks. I, I, I do. I noticed that straight away with, with Mock tearing that, that pressure on the, the lead leg. I, I just think yeah. that after maybe two or three really, really hard leg kicks, um, he's going to start to feel it. And he doesn't strike me as the guy that will probably chain, uh, switch stance either to try and protect it. He wasn't checking any of the leg kicks that steel was throwing, but steel yeah. doesn't throw those kicks the with the same heat as Sadiq. So I'm excited about Sadiq. I think he's going to win via TKO, probably leg kicks. But if he, if he catches Mokhtarian on the chin, I think he's, he's going out as well. So yeah, I've got Sadiq Yusuf to win via TKO. Then in the next fight of the night, we've got Paul Craig against the newcomer, Jim Crout. Who have you got in this one, John? Uh, yeah. Um, another interesting fight, this one. Um, I know it's a, a tough one for you talking about Paul Craig's last fight. Cause I know you had uh, well, not. a bet on, uh, Ankele <laughs> and, and, and to be honest, that was the that was the fight that that saved uh, Paul Craig's career in the UFC. Um, saved me fucking bankroll though, did it? <laughs> um, yeah, he, he got absolutely dominated for um, fourteen minutes and fifty nine seconds of the fight, and then uh, it wasn't even fifty nine seconds. It was a third <laughs> of a second. It was absolutely crazy, and uh, and then yeah, just threw up a desperation triangle, and um, and and. An unbelievably ankle I have uh, tapped to it. So uh, here he is. He has another fight against uh, against the newcomer Jim Crout. Um, Crout undefeated. He, he, he's a young guy. He's only 22 years old. Uh, I saw him in his. Uh, I watched him in his fight against um, Chris Birchler in Dana White's Contender Series, and um, wasn't really sure what to make of him in that fight. Um, the guy doesn't look particularly big. Uh, I don't think for. For, for light heavyweight, um, I don't know where that's because Bertrand just looked a lot bigger than him. So whether going up against Paul Craig, he'll he'll look similar size, but he didn't look uh, didn't look particularly big, and he, he looked quite nervous in that fight. Um, a contender series, it looked like he had a lot of nervous energy. He was throwing some wild shots early on. Um, he's hittable. Uh, Bertrand reddened up his face quite early, um, caught him with a number of shots, um, and that, that, in that fight though. That, 
they were both just trading and, and Crute was standing there and, and, and standing his ground and basically saying, yeah, we, we, we're going to we're gonna trade hands in this fight and uh, and I'm not backing down. Um, I did like the way that he, he ends combinations, crisp combinations with a leg kick. Um, he, was, he, he looked quick for the division. He was a lot quicker than, uh, than Bircher in the striking exchanges. And I think that's going to be the case with, uh, with Paul Craig as well. I think Craig's... Um, Biggest danger is, is his submission game and, and on the mat. As we know, he, he's got that triangle choke against Ankalaev. He, he beat um, Luis Enrique de Silva armbar. And then go back to his, his Bama days, um, triangle choke over Lazars and uh, a guillotine win over Carl Moore. He's got a number of um, submission wins on his on his record. I think that's going to be his um, his best chance of winning this with the fight on the, the mat and... Um, and, and looking for a submission, but yeah, I like Crute. I like the youngster. I think um, I think he's he, he obviously has got power in his hands. We we saw that at Birchler. Um Again, some people were saying that was a bit of an early stoppage. He didn't completely put him out. He he just hit him with a nice um, nice straight followed by a left hook, and and Birchler was um, was doing the, the chicken dance, and and the ref jumped in before any more strikes were were landed, and. Yeah, some people argued that it was a bit of a, a quick stoppage, but uh, I can I can see why he stopped the fight. He he obviously uh, caused a, a lot of damage with that strike, and uh, and I, yeah, I think he's going to, um, as I've said many times tonight, actually, I think he's going to uh, going to dominate on the feet. I think he's going to beat uh, Paul Craig up. Um, I think Craig's going to try and take it to the mat. Um, I'm not. 100% sure on on on, on Kruitz, um takedown defence. Um, Bircher didn't didn't attempt any takedowns in that fight, and uh, it'll be interesting to see whether he can he can stuff any takedown attempts on Paul Craig. If he if he does, then I I definitely think he's going to win this fight. I definitely think he's going to uh, going to beat him up and on the feet. Um, but yeah, I think I think Paul Craig gets finished in this one. I'm going uh, I'm going with Jim Crute, and I think he's going to get him out there quite early. I think it's going to be first round early second round yeah i i like crew as well um he looks really fluid on the feet i think his his striking's really crisp um it's it, it's thought about i don't think it's thrown out there sloppy or or in panic and uh, I, I just feel that everything's measured in what he does now the the one red flag that i've stated because crew's uh been quite popular along um sorry amongst the the mma betting community yeah. and I, I totally understand it for me my only concern because every fight it doesn't matter who you pick and who you bet on the, there's always going to be a concern with with that that fighter his opponent and the fight itself and you alluded to it as well is if paul craig can get a takedown on uh jim crew what is jim crew like off his back now um i have seen crew very briefly on his back but whether that's um whether his opponent is anything like the the quality of grappler Paul Craig is, I'm not sure. And I do give credit to Paul Craig in that respect. I do think he's a good grappler. Yeah. Uh, we saw shades of it against uh, Ankalaev. You know, Ankalaev, Dagestani born Russian. Um, he managed to get Ankalaev down a couple of times. He just couldn't do anything with it because no. the Dagestanis are just so good at grappling. And even to the point where Ankalaev had to get on both knees and double leg Paul Craig. I don't know if you remember that. He picked it. He picked him up yeah, and yeah. turned the corner when he was on two knees. Um, <laughs> so he he even had to do some really really like cool stuff to watch just to get those dominant positions back against Paul Craig. So I do think uh, Craig is a good grappler. That is my concern in this fight for Crew. If he is taken down and Paul Craig is given time to work, uh, I think Craig will have the advantage in that spot. But He's got to get Crew down first. And again, I mentioned it with Kunchenko and Akami earlier. A, a big part of staying vertical when you need to stay vertical is speed and movement. And uh, Jim Crew works really well in those departments. Um, his movement is fluid. He is in and out really well. He does recognise danger and he is quick and he will be the quicker fighter against Paul Craig. So Craig's really going to have to time that takedown pretty much to perfection to to get crew yeah. down i think he can do it um but like i say it's not going to be an easy task for him and I, paul craig strikes me as the type as well that if and do you know what i'm, I'm not even going to pinpoint paul craig in this respect i think from a grappler for any fighter that's a grappler if you miss your first two or three takedowns i think you you instantly start to question how you're going to get that fight down you, you're going to have to make adjustments but then you're making 
in cage adjustments in fight adjustments which isn't easy to do when you're trying to focus on the fight itself so um i think if paul craig does miss on a few of his takedowns i think he'll start to question whether he can get crew down that'll allow crew to start getting getting off his strikes a little bit better and ultimately i do think crew's going to knock paul craig out um from the way they're predicting this card i'm predicting a lot of finishes man like um yeah. <laughs> I just think a lot there's not going to be many fights that are going to go going to go the distance and i don't think this one will i think even if paul craig's successful in this fight i think he'll end up grabbing a submission um and that'll be his his method of victory so yeah, yeah i don't see it in the scorecards but um i do think jim crew's going to shine on his ufc debut so i've got jim crew to win via tko now in the next fight of the night we've got in my opinion one of the best pieces of matchmaking not only on this card but also for a very long time and you know i'm not criticizing the matchmaking i just think this is a really really good fight we've got jake matthews fighting at home versus the new anthony rocco martin which to anybody that doesn't know tony martin has changed his name officially in the world of mma <laughs> so i suppose we have to call him arm now right <laughs> Tony right yeah <laughs> so who have you got in this one john yeah like you said this is a really good fight i'm really looking forward to this one um jake matthews looks um Looks resurgent since he's he's moved up in weight class. Um, as has um, Martin. I can't bring myself to call him Anthony Rocco Martin, so I'm just going to call him Martin. Um, yeah, as has Martin. So it's it's going to be a really interesting fight. Um, Martin, we saw with a, a fantastic performance in his his last outing against Ryan the Flair. Um, he did what we thought he'd do. He he stayed long. He, he kept his distance he he picked the flare apart with uh with one twos and um landed some nice kicks and eventually um hammered the flare with that head kick and and follow-up punches to to get the stoppage win in the third round and he he's had a bit of a tear at the moment i mean he's only lost in his last six fights has come against um olivier obin mercier who's um very good grappler very good wrestler um and that was um, that was when they were back down at uh, 155 pounds. Jay Matthews, uh, he's, he's looked fantastic in his um, his last couple of fights. Um, he, he beat uh, fight before last, but uh, he beat Jinglang Li, who we saw last week in um, in the fight of the night at UFC 221. Uh, that was a great fight, great back and forth. He, Jay Matthews showed his power at, um, at that weight class by by knocking uh, Jingliang down. And then in his his last fight, he he brushed past uh, Anzai with with relative ease. Uh, first round rear naked choke. He um he stuffed the takedowns of Anzai. He knew knew the game plan coming in would be to try and take him down. He he stuffed the the takedowns. Got a takedown uh, of himself um, of his own and and worked and, and locked on the the rear naked choke and and got the submission win. Um. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, uh, Matthews, which which I think people forget. He's only he's only 24 years old, um, and he's got he's got solid wrestling as well, and and he, he does possess power in his hands. So it's, this one's a really really tough fight for me to predict. And I am going with the uh, the hometown guy, Matthews, in this one. I I, I think he's going to edge it. I think it's going to be a really close fight. I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if uh, if Martin comes away with the victory. But um, I just I like Matthews' all round game. I, he's aggressive. He's powerful. He's um, he's got wrestling. He's got jujitsu, and I, I think if Martin um, does try to to keep range and, and, and keep distance with those those one twos and, and throwing out the jab, I think I think Matthews will be able to pressure him and um, and just outwork him and and, and eventually um, push him against the cage and, and, and clinch and, and get the trip takedown like the trip takedown we saw against. Uh, Against Anzai and then and then work his his ground game and um and yeah I'm, I I think Matthews is going to edge this one but um but yeah he, he, it's a real uh, real toss up between the two for this one it, it's a fight I'm really looking forward to but I'm going with the hometown guy uh, Jack Matthews I'm I'm going with a, a a very narrow decision victory yeah I I agree it's it's a really tough fight to call and. You know, when you look at the betting lines, you've got Jake Matthews uh, minus 140 settled out. I think he opened it like plus 100 or plus 105, but that suddenly disappeared. Okay, yeah. Um, So, yeah, we've got Jake Matthews at minus 140 with Tony Martin sort of like the plus 120, plus 125 mark. And I, I do believe that Martin does hold the value in the in this fight from a betting perspective. Um, 
but that's only because he's the fight with the plus money behind him. If it was the other way around and it was Jake uh, Matthews with the plus money uh, on him, then he would hold the value. I just think this fight is really, really close. Now, um, I'm ultimately leaning Jake Matthews as well. Yeah. The reason I'm leaning Jake Matthews is because Tony Martin seems to uh, is a fighter I like. By the way, let me just get get straight into that. I, I think that um, I think he's talented. I think he's well rounded. I like the move up to um, uh, up to welterweight from lightweight. You know, I, I love it when fighters decide that enough's enough in regards to a weight cut. They want to be healthier. Yeah. And you yeah. know, you look at the record of fighters that move up. They actually they're actually really successful. So I, I don't understand why more fighters don't do it, considering a lot a lot of other fighters have been so like look at the middleweight title fight. Um, yeah. Up next year that's against two X. Well, that's with two X welterweights. So, yeah. Um, but I digress. So yeah, I, I do like Tony Martin, but the, the one type of fighter that he struggles to be is, uh, the bigger athletic fighter that's well rounded, yeah. that can grapple and that can strike. Um, and the perfect example of that is, uh, Olivier Aubin Mercier, you know, I know that was down at lightweight, but Aubin Mercier was the bigger dude inside the cage, not by a huge amount, amount, but you could tell he was the slightly bigger guy. Um, he was also uh, the more athletic guy. He also had good grappling and he had decent uh, striking as well. So, like I say, the well-rounded type of fighter that that I'm describing here. And although that was a close fight and it was, you know, it was a 29-28, and Martin had a lot of success in that third round against OAM. Um, he lost the fight and. Ultimately, I think that um, he would have lost to Lafleur as well. Bear in mind, I bet Martin in that fight. Um, but I think he would have lost to Lafleur if Lafleur wasn't so old, on the verge of retirement, and also extremely injured as well. You know, he was plagued yeah. by a lot of repetitive injuries that he just couldn't shake. So I think if Lafleur wasn't so injured and uh, wasn't, you know, on on the verge of retirement. I think that he would have definitely, definitely struggled in that fight against Lafleur, And that's ultimately what I think we're going to get here with Jake Matthews. Matthews has filled out ridiculously. You know, he was at lightweight as well, and then he moved up. Yeah, to he's a beast now. People were thinking, you know, what's he doing moving up to welterweight? He wasn't a big lightweight as it is. And then suddenly, like within the space of about six months, he filled out ridiculously. And now he looks like an absolute tank. He could probably get away <laughs> with fighting at middleweight. So yeah. <laughs> um, the dude's big and he's quick as well for his size. You know, he's put on, uh, he's put on a lot of... Uh, a lot of muscle and like I said filled out into his body but he, he doesn't seem to have lost his speed and only gained power um and then like I say he's, he's a good scrambler and he's good on the mat as well I think Tony Martin will have the slight advantage on the mat in regards to uh the grappling skills I know you mentioned that Jake Matthews is a black belt but listen Tony Martin is no slouch on the mat either yeah um, true. so I with Tony Martin as well, I think his scrambles are slightly better, which is important in this fight because I do think at some point this fight is going to hit the mat. And Tony Martin's got some real crafty stuff to um, um, to sort of get sweeps and get himself into better positions, like that Kimura sweep that he uses. Um, we didn't see it. Yeah. We didn't see it against uh, Lafleur, but you know we saw it against Nakamura a couple of times, and it was really effective. And Nakamura again, like we mentioned earlier, is a good grappler. So yeah, yeah. Tony Martin definitely has advantage in this fight, but so does uh, Jake Matthews. I just feel that the physicality of Jake Matthews, and I, I, I honestly don't think that people, and including myself, will realise the extent this size advantage until we see them at the weigh-ins well after they've weighed in and they've squared up after they've hydrated a little bit at that point you're going to see the extent of the size difference and i've got a feeling it's going to be very very noticeable um i just think matthews can land more volume on tony martin tony martin does do a good job uh darting in and out of range um boxing he's really good at that he's also ever improving at american top team as you can tell just by the way i'm breaking this down i'm constantly just giving <laughs> each guy like um sort of advantages well not advantages but uh paths to victories in in, in this fight and it is going to be very close jake matthews though is fighting at home now i know he lost that decision against uh holbrook at home which yeah. surprised a lot of people. I thought Matthews won that fight very marginally, but being at home, I thought he would get the nod uh, from from the judges, but he, he he didn't. It was completely opposite, and at that point, Matthews was really hyped as well. I just don't think we see a second version of that. I think if it's close going to the judges' scorecards in this fight, which I think it will, I don't see any of these guys finishing. Tony Martin's got a good chin. Jake Matthews has got a good chin. Uh, I think they're both too good on the mat, um, 
to to submit one another unless one makes a glaring mistake. Um, I do think it's going to hit the scorecards, and I just think if it's close, the Aus- the Australian judges, well, maybe they're not from Australia, but you know what I mean. I think he's going to get yeah. he's he's going to get that that nod from the judges on the scorecard. So yeah, I've got Jake Matthews to win a very very close fight, a potential split decision as well via decision. Then in the next fight of the night, we've got Tyson Pedro versus Shogun Hua. So John, who have you got in this one? Yeah, we see in the um, the legend Shogun Hua return to action. Um, I, I can't say that I'm <laughs> particularly happy about it. I, I love Shogun. Um, he's one of my favourite fighters of all time. But after another um, brutal finish against uh, Anthony Smith, I'd, I think I'd have liked him to um, to maybe have a little bit more time off and um, just just get his. Uh, Get his, his, his health and stuff back after that. Um, after he took some heavy blows by uh, by Smith, um, and he's coming up against a, uh, a dangerous up and comer in um, in Tyson Pedro. It's it's an interesting fight. This one. Um, ultimately, I'm 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 going with uh, with Tyson Pedro to win this fight. But um, but yeah, uh, it's an interesting one. Pedro's lost two of his last three, but they're against. Very good uh, opposition in uh, Ilya Latifi and uh, Ovin Sempru. Uh, that Sempru fight, he he, um, he he got himself in a bit of a Pedro got himself in a bit of a sticky situation on the uh, on the ground uh, when they were scrambling and eventually uh, succumbed to that straight arm lock. I thought he could have um, could have maybe disengaged and, and separated halfway through that, but. Um, but yeah, he he, he wasn't to be, and he he ended up losing. Um, Losing via submission in that fight, but uh, he, he's dangerous. He does possess power, as we saw with the uh, the Paul Craig finish, that that big elbow. But uh, again, Pedro's a guy. I think he does his um, he's most dangerous with uh, with his submissions. He he does set up uh, a lot of his submissions with his striking as well. Um, Shogun, I just think he's his best days are behind him he's 37 years old now I know before the Anthony Smith fight he he, um, he won three straight against um, Nogueira uh, Corey Anderson and Volante but um, the Anderson fight I, I thought he lost and uh, the Nogueira fight you're going back to 2015 I know it was only um, three or four fights ago but you, you go back to 2015 and um, and when you get to this stage in your career, I think the, the jump sometimes from um, a 33, 34 year old up to a 37 year old is is quite a drastic one, and you can uh, obviously you decline a lot quicker um, the older you get. And, and yeah, I just think um, I think Pedro is going to be the more athletic um, fighter. I think he's uh, he's going to be able to, to push a higher pace. Um, Chogan, uh, despite getting finished in that last fight against Smith, he, he, he's, he's tough. He's, he's, he's tough as old, which you can never rule him out of a fight. Um, but, but yeah, I think, I think Pedro is going to, um, going to light him up on the feet. And I think he, he, he may drop Shogun and I might, I, he, he may, uh, jump on the back or, or jump for an arm bar or something and, um, and add another submission to his, uh, to his record. And, um, and yeah, he, It'll be a shame if if that does happen for the Shogun. Who well, he's one of these fighters that I would like to see hang them up pretty soon. I know that fighters are, uh, are tough characters, and um, especially like I say, he, he he won his previous three fights before the Anthony Smith fight. But I, I don't think Shogun's got nothing else to prove. He I don't think he's going to challenge for the for the title anytime soon. So. Um, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to see maybe if he does lose, maybe he'll get another fight, maybe back in Brazil uh, next year, um, and then hopefully he'll, he'll he'll call it time on his career after that. But yeah, I'm going with Tyson Pedro in this fight. I think he's going to, um, like I say, he's going to be the more athletic. He, he, I think he's going to land shots on uh, on Shogun, which will eventually wear Shogun down and 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 cause him to to drop. And um, and and Pedro's going to going to lock on some kind of submission and. Um, and get the victory. Yeah, and I sort of, I mean, I'd love nothing more, by the way, than Shogun uh, to get a victory here because oh, definitely. Um, he's, he's one of my heroes, uh, along with Chuck Liddell. Both of those guys um, are guys that I looked up to when you know when I first started watching yeah. uh, watching MMA and guys that I just really enjoyed watching fight. They were both exciting and they were both ridiculously talented. Um, so it is sad to see both 
both of them going through what they're going through right now, especially obviously Chuck and uh, his fight last weekend against Tito, which oh, should man. have never happened. But um, I just I disagree with uh, with something that you said in regards to after the Anthony Smith fight, you'd like to have seen Shogun take a little bit more time off. I disagree. I, I would have liked to have seen Shogun hang them up there. And <laughs> anyway, because, yeah. And, like he's had, you know, he's had such a decorated career. Um, is is a legend of the sport, not only in the UFC but Pride as well. Um, he's yeah. given everything that he can possibly give to the sport, and I just think he's putting himself through. I mean, I was there. I was in attendance in Hamburg when he got knocked out, and I was very. It was at the side of the cage where um we were cage side. And it was the side of the cage where we were at, so I was very close to it, and it it wasn't. It it really wasn't nice to see at all. Um. I know we love the sport. I know we love violence and and stuff like that. But yeah. when it's a legend getting put out in that in that manner, um, it's not nice to see. No. In this fight, I I just don't think it it matches well for him stylistically either. Um, I think I don't think he can get it to the mat. I think Tyson Pedro will be too big, too strong. Um, and I also think that uh, Pedro's got some nice reversals and in, in the scrambles as well. So I think he could possibly get on top and land some ground and pound or submit Shogun. But personally, I, I think Shogun will struggle to to get the fight to the mat anyway. Just the pure physicality of Tyson Pedro should be enough to fend any sort of takedown attempts from Shogun. Um, and on the feet, I think Tyson Pedro is just he's just too quick. He's just so much quicker than Shogun is right now. He's got too much power. That chin for me is is probably gone now. Um, I just think Tyson Pedro is going to find that chin. He's going to find it early on. He found it against Ovin St. Pru, and you know I bet Tyson Pedro in that fight. I was so annoyed with um, <laughs> with how he went about it. I mean, it was a winning night for me anyway, so I wasn't totally um, I was I wasn't totally annoyed, but. It, it, it prevented a, a sweep on the night from my betting point of view anyway. And he, he had the fight. He had it won and he gave it away. And it was disappointing to see. So you do have to question, uh, you know, Tyson Pedro's fight IQ to an extent because I don't think you can do that sort of thing at this level of, uh, of MMA in the UFC and sort of get away with it. And I know he didn't get away with it, but I mean, not have people talk about it because this yeah. is the highest level of the sport. But I just, I don't think that I don't think fight IQ is even going to come into it with Shogun. I think he's going to crack Shogun early. And unfortunately I think he's going to knock Shogun out. And I think it is going to be another bad knockout. And at that point, I, I don't want to see Shogun back in Brazil. I just I, I want to see him hanging him up and doing something else in the sport, whether that be coaching or um, whether that be coming on some sort of, you know, um, commentary panel or, you know, th- there's so many different avenues for, for yeah. these legends once they finish the sport. But, um, yeah, going back to the fighting question itself, I think Tyson Pedro is going to knock him out. I think he's going to knock him out early and brutally. So I've got Tyson Pedro to win via knockout. And then in the co-main event of the evening, we've got Mark Hunt on his retirement fight yeah. versus Justin Willis. Who have you got, John? Yeah, um, another guy who's been around um, sport, MMA and K1 and... For for years and years, forty uh, four year old Mark Hunt is uh, he's finally deciding to to hang them up uh, against uh, and his his retirement fight is going to be against uh, Big Pretty uh, Justin Willis. Um, I think this is a pretty good fight for Mark Hunt to to go out on, and I think it's a um, a fight that he's going to win. I'm going to go with um, Hunt to win this one. Uh, I know he's lost three of his last four, and he he definitely is on the decline. He's um, he he doesn't seem to possess quite as much power in those hands as uh, as he used to. I thought he was going to put um, Alexi Olenek away in their fight. He he, he did land some some bombs, but uh, Alexi t- took those shots um, and, and eventually uh, got a submission victory. Um, but yeah, I th- I th- from what I've seen from from Justin Willis, I haven't been. Um, overly impressed I mean he, he, he's he got a good record he lost his uh, very first fight as a professional and then he's, he's won every fight since but um, the guys he's fought against and won um, especially UFC guys um, James Mulheron in his first uh, his first fight he, he won that via decision uh, Mulheron of course was um, <laughs> 
Death Street doesn't look like the kind of guy that would uh, be popped for performance enhancing drugs, but he <laughs> uh, he was <laughs> he was after that fight. Um, and then then he beat Alan Crowder. Crowder uh, he looked more of a light heavyweight to me, and um, and no offense to Crowder, but I wasn't overly impressed with. Um, what he displayed in that fight, and then Chase Sherman, who we spoke about, um, we spoke about last week um, uh, when we were talking about uh, one of the fights on the Beijing card, uh, the fight itself. I can't quite remember now, but um, we we spoke about um, it was the Richard Coulter fight. Um, yes, yeah, Sherman's not um, an elite heavyweight, and I, I don't think he ever will be. So. Um, at where Justin Willis is ability levels at I'm not quite a hundred percent sure yet um he does possess heavy hands as we saw in the crowd uh, fight and um and and back early in his career um wins in world series of fighting but um but yeah I think I think Mark Hunt's going to take this one I think um I think he'll be able to take the the shots from Willis we know uh Hunt's got a, an iron chin um that's been tested a bit more recently he, he lost to Overy with that massive um, massive knee back at UFC 209, which caused him to face plant, and um, of course he he lost fights to Vadum by that flying knee and and Steve Amiocic, but that was in the fifth round of their fight. I think that was an accumulation of strikes. So, so yeah, I think um, I think Hunt will be able to um, withstand the shots that Willis has to offer, um, and I still think Hunt possesses enough knockout power. I mean, he's still got hands of stone that will that can knock guys out and um eventually i think one of those shots will land on willis and uh, it will rock him and um and he will get a stoppage win uh on his on his last last ever performance uh, last ever appearance in uh in mixed martial arts and he'll go out with a bang yeah i I'm, I'm going with mark hunt as well now I mean, obviously, the the fight that you just mentioned, the Alexei Linick fight, you know, that was so weird. And, like, anybody that that was following sort of the MMA betting community and, and the lines and, you know, Mark Hunt started at something like minus 300, uh, minus 350, I think it was. And then I bet Mark Hunt, uh, when he sort of hit the minus 200 mark, I thought, right, that's as low as it's going to go. But then as fight week progressed, it dropped down from minus 200 to minus 170, minus 170 to minus 150, minus 150 to minus uh, 120. Then I think he ended up going to a plus number. And this this is just before he was, he was, uh, he was due to walk out as well. And yeah. pretty much everybody in the MMA betting community had bet him at some point in that, you know, in, in, <laughs> In that downfall of his odds, yeah. because at some points, at, at, at every point, someone thought that they were getting value on the fight, which I agree with. Yeah, it almost turned. I've never in in all the time I've been gambling uh, with MMA, I've never seen uh, such a, a one sided um, a, a one sided reaction from the community. Yeah, it was literally. Alexi Linick versus the the gambling world, um, <laughs> and yeah, like something was something was really weird. And then Mark Hunt came out with uh, with uh, the plaster on his arm, I think it was, or, or a bandage. I can't remember what it was, but then yeah, there, there was rumours that he'd been bitten, and you know there, there was loads of things. I I personally think he, he may have been carrying some sort of injury that somebody in Russia found out, and then obviously started steaming the Linick line. Um, but yeah, that that was really strange. I think that Mark Hunt would win that fight probably eight times out of ten. Yeah. Um, I do still think that uh, is a decent fight when someone's not trying to wrestle him. However, Justin Willis trains at AKA, very yeah. close to Daniel Cormier. Very, you know, he's is I was gonna say a very good wrestler. Um, but we haven't seen so much of his wrestling to to judge it that high. No. Um, I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying I don't think he's exposed it yet. Um, but he can wrestle and he can get fights to the mat, and you know he's gonna is that level of his game is gonna be improving so much being at a camp like AK when you're with Daniel Cormier and Cain Velasquez every single day. Um, and that's the path to victory to beat Mark Hunt. We saw yeah, Curtis definitely. Blades do it. Um, you know, it's a shame what happened to him in Beijing last week. But um, we saw Curtis Blades do it against Mark Hunt, uh, repeatedly take him down. Now, I'm going with Mark Hunt to win this fight. And I'm also uh, I'm also going to predict another walk-off KO as well. I just think what fitting way um, <clears throat> to end 
uh, a career in your hometown doing your trademark walk off KO, you know, yeah. the guy that's done it probably more times than anybody else. Um, but the reason why I'm going for Mark Hunt is because I don't think Justin Willis is at the level of wrestling and athletic ability as what Curtis Blades was. And I think no. at times, and I said this when I broke the Mark Hunt and Alexa Linick fight down, uh, because obviously we mentioned the takedowns and stuff. I know Curtis Blades got Hunt down 10 times, but it wasn't made easy for him. Blades had to work for pretty much every single one of them takedowns until maybe the latter half of the third round when Mark Hunt was tired. Mark Hunt can fend off takedowns. He didn't so well against against uh, a Linux, he sort of like rolled over his foot and fell over and a Linux pounced all over him. Um, so I suppose you can give Mark Hunt that, but I I think I don't think Mark Hunt gives takedowns up very easily. And Justin Willis will definitely have to work for him. And like I've already like I've just mentioned, I repeat again, I just don't think he's at the level of what someone like Curtis Blades was. So if Mark Hunt can defend the takedowns and disengage, again, like we've uh, spoken about previously in this podcast in regards to um you know, I mentioned it with Paul Craig, if he you know, if a few takedowns are missed, uh, you can sort of uh, you can sort of assume that the fighter's mentality is gonna uh, going to change as well because they're going to have to switch yeah. something up to try and get the fight to the mat. I just think Mark Hunt um, isn't so much slower than Justin Willis. You know, he might even be quicker. I'm, I'm not sure. It's a tough one to call in that respect. But I just think Mark Hunt catches Willis with something before Willis starts trying to engage the wrestling. I think Willis will try his luck standing, as most people do against Mark Hunt, before they start to try and initiate the... The, the takedowns and the ground game. Yeah. And I just think he's going to get caught um, as, as he's testing that striking game against Mark Hunt. I think he's going to play straight into to Mark Hunt's strengths. And uh, yeah, I think Mark Hunt gets his retirement win as well. Like I say, hopefully a walk-off KO as well. It'll be, just be a really fitting tribute to the guy that's also given a lot to the sport. You know, his record's not great, but why is his record not great? Because he's given us entertaining fights. He's yeah, put for himself, sure, man. He's put himself in those positions where it's either him or them. And um, as an MMA fan, how can you not love that? How can you not love the guy? So, yeah, I'm going Mark Hunt to win, and I'm going to take him via knockout. Then in the main event of the evening, we've got Junior Dos Santos, the veteran, versus the up-and-comer heavyweight, Tai Tuivasa. So is it a veteran lesson, or is Tai Tuivasa's hype going to prove its worth? Um, For me, it's a veteran lesson. Um. It's a fight that I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm excited. Ty Tuvas is a guy that I, I think will have a big future. Um, definitely a big future in the sport. Can he go all the way to the top and, and be a heavyweight champion of the world? Quite possibly, yeah. Um, he, he, he's exciting. Like I say, he's only 25 years old, which is very, very young in, um, in heavyweight terms. So it's great to see him on the scene already and doing so well on the scene. But I think this fight is just going to come a little too soon for him um when we talk at dos santos what really springs to mind to me is um he was one of the first podcasts i did with you when um the the, the black or even off fight when yeah. he came over and um and made his debut and, and and you went with dos santos and i went with even in that fight and dos santos did exactly what um you said he'd do and what I said I'd feared he might do and it's it was the same sort of performance that we saw in the, the Ben Rothwell fight as well where he um, he uses his new uh, style of his he's, he's, he's less rash and he's a lot more um, focused on crisp sharp boxing uh, working behind a very very crisp jab one of the the most crisp jabs in the, the heavyweight division for me um, he absolutely schooled Ben Rothwell uh, in their fight I was, had the pleasure of, um, of being there in, at that event in uh, Zagreb as I mentioned last week and, and, and yeah he absolutely um, absolutely schooled him in that fight and uh, it was the same with the even I fight he, he, he just outworked him outboxed him um, kept range with that jab and, and just showed a, a mature veteran head um, that the, the kind of game plan that a guy who who knows he's I don't want to say he's chin suspect but he's taken damage and he, he knows that he can't get into wild brawls anymore um, and yeah I think we're going to see another similar example in this fight uh, two of us are, I was 
all on that hype train. I'm still half on that hype train for Tuivasa, but I, I just think um, I mentioned this. I've mentioned this over the last few weeks that maybe sometimes we are jumping on the uh, the train a little too early. Um, I say this quite often as well. You, you only you can only beat who's put in front of you. But when we we look now in hindsight, it's a lovely thing. When we look at the Rashad Coulter fight and the Cyril Asker fight, those two guys really, no offence to them, are, are not top level. Uh, UFC heavyweights, as we saw uh, Coulter last both weekend. Break the top five. <laughs> um, as we saw Coulter uh, move down to light heavyweight, um, big win as well. Big yeah, he, 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 he needed that win, and that was a that was a really good fight. That was an exciting fight. I enjoyed that. But yeah, um, he's a he's a sloppy fighter who who likes to get involved in slugfests and um, and, and gets tired out quite quickly. And and Cyril Asker, I mean, he. He just got absolutely pummeled by Tuivasa. But then when we saw Tuivasa come up against uh, another veteran of the sport, someone who's um, more technically savvy in uh, Andre Arlovsky in his last fight, he was a lot closer. And some people argued that Arlovsky won that fight um, at the time. I, I think I argued in favour of Arlovsky. I have watched it back and it's very close. I can see why Tuivasa won that fight. But... Um, a lot of people say that Arlovsky's got a, uh, a glass gin and, and he took some of uh, Tuvasa's bombs and, 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 and saw out the fight and some people argued that he, he, he should have won the fight. So um, sometimes you can't read too much into these early fights uh, against uh, for guys who are, who are um, just starting out in their UFC careers because obviously they're not coming up against the, the highest level. And, I think this will be a step too far for Tuivasa. Like I said, I think Dos Santos will out jab him and, and and just outscore him. I, I, again, I think he'll he'll go to a decision. Um, Dos Santos has proven that he can uh, go the distance. He went the distance quite easily with Ben Rothwell. He um, and and again against um, against Ivanov in his last fight, and he doesn't seem to tar out with his new style. It's not particularly uh, overexertive. Just fizzing out that jab whenever your opponent um, steps forward. Uh, Tuvasa, to win this fight, he's going to have to back Dos Santos up. He's going to have to get his back against the fence, similar to uh, to how Miocic did, and he's he's going to have to flurry um, to the point where Dos Santos can't circle out and get his back off the cage, and, and you've got to hope that you can put him away with, with one of those heavy shots um, before he can circle out, and I think that's the key to, to victory for Tuvasa, but I don't think he's going to be able to do it. I think Dos Santos is too much of a um, a wily veteran in the sport, and I think he'll um, he, he's technically technically sound enough to uh, to stick behind that jab. And um, again, I think it's going to be a decision win over five rounds for uh, for Junior Dos Santos. Yeah, and I agree. Um, I think uh, a lot of what I'm about to break down is going to be the the same stuff that you heard or very similar stuff that you heard in the last breakdown with the Ivanov fight because yeah. we know what Junior Dos Santos is all about. You've just covered pretty much every point that, that you can make about this fight, really. Um, the, the ways that you beat Junior Dos Santos, you've got to have forward pressure, you've got to have volume and you've got to be able to cut off the cage um, because what Junior Dos Santos does is... He he throw he'll throw a single jab out there. He'll move backwards and he's got his his uh his awareness of where he is in the cage is is so so good. It's almost like a goalkeeper in football knowing that he's in the middle of the posts. You know, yeah. Um, he knows when his back's very close to the cage and he angles out really really well. Now I met again. I mentioned this in the last breakdown of the Ivanov fight. What we saw Stipe Miocic do when he knocked him out in their second fight um, is the is exactly what you need to beat Junior Dos Santos in, in 2018. You know, Stipe came forward, he, he had volume, he was aggressive, and he cut off the angles, and that's the key part. The cutting off the angles is so, so key to beating jo- uh, Junior Dos Santos because he he exits away from uh, he exits away from the cage so, so well. Um, yeah. And I just don't think Tuivasa has got um, he's got aggression, so he'll move forward. I don't think he cuts off the cage very well. He didn't do it so well against uh, Arlovsky. Yes, he did it against Asker, but he pinned Asker and uh, Coulter. He, he hit with like a jump knee, um, yeah. you know, against the cage. So that really 
doesn't prove nor disprove what I'm trying to say about Tuivasa, but um, I don't think he cuts off the cage too well, and he doesn't pack volume, and this is key, again, another key thing, he's sort of a, a one-shot or one-two-shot sort of guy, uh, yeah. whereas Stipe to knock Junior Dos Santos out, and this is this is why I had that rant before, and I, luckily, I, well, not luckily, but I'm glad that I haven't heard many people say that Dos Santos's chin is gone this time around because that's one thing I was ranting about the last time people <laughs> saying his chin gone I was like no it hasn't you know Miocic had to hit him five or six times clean to knock him out um so I just think that Tuivasa does pack power and can he knock Junior Dos Santos out absolutely he can knock him out but Junior Dos Santos is no is no more likely to get knocked out by Tai Tuivasa than any other heavyweight on the roster, apart from Curtis Blades. I still think he's got a good chin, regardless of what Ngannou did. Um, <laughs> but I, I just don't think he's any more likely to get knocked out than anybody else in the heavyweight division. Uh, of course, he could get caught with that one shot. But listen, in that Ivanov fight, we saw late on Dos Santos get cracked a few times. And a few times, because I mean, I bet on Dos Santos in that fight. And a few times I was like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? Is, is he gonna, Is he going to go out? And he didn't. Yeah. Um, the one thing I will say that I didn't like from Dos Santos that I'd not seen before um, in that Ivanov fight is uh, a few times again late on when Ivanov was coming on a little bit stronger when he knew he was losing the fight, um, Junior Dos Santos was sort of running away. Um, he, he, he was sort of turning his shoulders a bit, not showing his back, but just turning his shoulders a bit, uh, running away with his head down. I don't like to see that. Um, mm. And that is something new that I saw from Dos Santos. So that's maybe something to watch out for in this fight. Now, I think this fight is going to be very similar to the Ivanov fight, except for a couple of little differences. Whereas uh, Ivanov was easier to beat early on, but came on stronger later in the fight. I think Taito Ivasa is going to be very dangerous in the first round maybe seven and a half minutes but i think the yeah. longer this fight goes on the much more easier it's going to be for dos santos than what the Ivanov fight was because even yeah. kept up his cardio and this is another reason why i'm really surprised unless taito ivas has got something up his sleeve in regards to uh perfecting his cardio i'm very surprised he's took a five round fight after what happened in the arlovsky fight because yeah. he was huffing and puffing and hands on the hips and um, fair play to the guy. He stayed in there for three rounds. He didn't get to the point where he physically couldn't do anything. So I do, I do commend him for that. But the yeah. point is, from being fresh to gassed, took about maybe six or seven minutes of the fight. And I just feel when you're in there for twenty five minutes with Dos Santos chasing him, he's not, he's not going to be able, he's not going to be able to do twenty five minutes like that unless, yeah. unless he paces himself in this fight. But if he paces himself in this fight and doesn't overexert himself, he's just going to be stuck on the end of Dos Santos's jab. I just think it's a really bad stylistic fight for him. I'm also with you. I was well aboard on board that hype train before the Arlovsky fight, but Arlovsky exposed him and his 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 game and his uh, his weaknesses and deficiencies so so much. Like yeah. if this if this fight with Junior Dos Santos was before the Arlovsky fight, I'm telling you now we'd probably get. No, we would get Dos Santos a, a plus money, a underdog money. I'm telling you now we would. It's only because of that Arlovsky fight that Junior Dos Santos is the favourite. And that's, yeah. like I say, because he exposed him. So, you know what? I was actually go, go, going to go for um, Dos Santos to win this by decision, but I think he could stop him late it, because I do see uh, Taito Ivasa... Um, if he starts off slow, which he might do, he, he might start off smart knowing it's a five round fight and try to try to save some of that gas tank. But yeah. I'm telling you now when that when the point hits where he's two or three rounds down, he's gonna unload in one of those rounds and that's gonna completely empty his tank. So I could see Junior Dos Santos with a late uh, a late stoppage here wouldn't surprise me if it went to a decision you know dos santos is a veteran um and he, he'll take that decision if he needs to but if tie to Ivasa does tire and dos santos realizes that he's now can take his best shot even if it lands flush hard and clean and that he can start pouring it on him it wouldn't surprise me if he grabbed himself a stoppage so i'm actually yeah. going to go for junior dos santos to win via tko yeah but is, that the, um, is that the first time we've we've Picked exactly the same winners yes. in, in every fight. I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, There's a first for everyone. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. Every single fight is exactly the same. Yeah. 
So yeah, no disagreements in this one. But no. here we go, guys, and welcome to the hot topics portion. So the first thing I'd like to kick this off is uh, surrounding the current UFC veterans in the sport. You know, we've got a lot of them on this card. We've got um, show. We've got Mark Hunt, who's obviously uh, retiring. We've got uh, JDS. We've got Shogun. We've got Yushin Akami, uh, Mizuta Hirota. So we, we've got some veterans, uh, a lot of veterans on this card. Um, but I'm wondering, John, what your thoughts are about the new waves of fighters coming in, especially from the Contender Series and obviously the Ultimate Fighters still as well. And if the veterans have still got a lot to give in this sport, you know, I personally think JDS has got a lot to give. But then you look on the flip side, I don't think uh, Shogun's got a lot to give. So... Um, these new fighters, at some point, they will always take the veteran lesson. Um, it's very rare, unless your name's Habib Nurmagomedov, that <laughs> you don't take that loss. Um, so what's your thoughts, John? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's going to be an interesting one. Cause like you say, there's a, there's a number of veterans on this card. The Santos Hunt, uh, Shogun, um, yeah, Yushin Um Yeah, and, and, and veterans are a, a, a crucial part of this this sport really and um as you say that i think it's it's really hard to to gauge with with veteran fighters like where they stand because like you say i, I think dos santos has still got a lot to give um in the heavyweight division but um shogun on the other hand <laughs> hasn't in the uh, the light heavyweight division and uh mark hunt's 44 he's got seven also years on uh, on Shogun, but I'd, I'd I'd say Mark Hunt still got more to give to the sport than uh, than, than Shogun. It's just um, different fighters deteriorate at, at different rates, and I know you talk about it a lot um, with um, fighters' actual age and their uh, like their fight age and their um, how long they've been fighting and the sort of damage that they've taken over the course of their career. But but yeah, I I, I think. Um, I think the veterans have still got a lot to give on this card and um, and in this sport in general. I think, uh, like, like we mentioned in the breakdowns, I think uh, Dos Santos is he, he's going to give a, a lesson to, to two of us in the main event. And I think um, I, I really wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future Dos Santos fights for the title again. I think he can work his way there with um, racking up these wins using this new style of his. Um, uh, although it might not be... Um, be the most exciting style but if he does um, keep getting these main events keep getting these five round fights and 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 if he can pick his opponent off late in the uh late in the fight like you say um you think that he will in this fight against two Vasa, then then I, I can't see why he, he he might not be able to work his way back into uh to to title contention um yeah but on the other hand the 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 sadder side of things is seeing people like Shogun, um, who we mentioned in the breakdowns, carry on fighting. He uh, he suffered that brutal knockout to to Anthony Smith, and and he really is a, a shell of his former self. And uh, I, I genuinely, I know he won the uh, the light heavyweight. Um, uh, was, yeah, he was the light heavyweight title in the uh, the UFC. But I think we saw his his best days back in pride um and he was he was a fantastic fighter back then and um and yeah i don't think we've seen the same shogun in the ufc that we saw in pride and he he, he really has um he he really is one of those fighters now that you you'd be happy to see him hang up the uh the gloves and 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 call it time i mean bear in uh, mind when when he did win the ufc light heavyweight title he just beat machida that nobody could beat at that time like machida was true, borderline yeah. as unbeatable as you, I, I don't even know if he was undefeated at that time he, he may have been uh, i could be wrong yeah. about that though but regardless like that machida was on a tear like nobody could stop him and then shogun came in came along and yeah, him, and got then, a draw somehow yeah <laughs> and, and then, then yeah him, yeah rematched and decisively um, finished him so yeah, when when you look across not just this card, when you look across the the, the UFC rankings and um, and across the sport in general, there's um, the veterans are still there or thereabouts in in every single weight class. I mean, a pound for pound number one he, he, he's Daniel Cormier, and he's coming up to to forty years old now, and um, and I know he hasn't got the particularly got the years in fight years um because he started his career in mixed martial arts quite late but even when you look through through the other weight divisions um bantamweight dominic cruz ranked um ranked number two i think in the rankings and he's 
coming up to about 35 years old now, I think. Um, and 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 bantamweight's a, a division where you uh, when you lose that speed and things, uh, the lower weight classes when you start to lose that speed, that's when it starts to become difficult. But a guy like Dominic Cruz is still ranked number two. We've got the featherweights. You've got uh, Jose Aldo, Frankie Edgar. Um, I mean, from from Daniel Cormier's point of view, being forty, that he's hitting his prime now for a heavyweight. Your heavyweight's yeah, to prime yeah, at about yeah. forty. So, you know, although we class it as old, um, it's really not. I mean, look at Junior da, Junior dos Santos. He's he's old. I'm not sure of his exact age off the top of my head. I think. Uh, yeah, he's th- well, actually, no, he's not. I'm lying. He's 34. So, you know, really, he, he Dos Santos has years probably him, yeah. got six years before he hits his prime. But, you know, it's whether he's taken so much damage. There's there's so many different variables in it. Um, and, you know, you alluded to it, it automatically um, or almost is how much damage they've taken in the career. If they haven't taken so much damage, especially as a heavyweight, then, yeah, they can peak at 40. Um, but I agree with you. And uh, I think that the veterans will always have something to give in this sport because um, whether it be teaching someone a veteran lesson, which I think uh, what Taito Ivasa is going to take this week. And by the way, that's going to do him a world of good. Like going in there, yeah. and if he does make five rounds with, with JDS, going in there and getting pieced up and beaten up for five rounds may not, you know, especially the hometown fans, they may not like it and people may, people, you know, if it doesn't happen, people may shoot me down for it. But I just think that is what's going to happen. But man, that is going to be good for Tui Vasa. He will be able to take so much, even if he doesn't do well in the fight. I think he will do well early, but let's hypothetically say he doesn't do well and he does just get pieced up for 25 minutes. He will still learn a shitload of, of yeah, definitely, uh, yeah. get a load of experience from that fight. So, so whether it be in taking a veteran lesson or just being there as a gauge for these up and coming fighters to see where they are. So for example, with, uh, with Christos Giagos against Mizo. Uh, Mizuto Hirota I think that's yeah. a good example of this because Hirota's only been finished once by, by submission Giagos has submissions but he's not really known for it but as a 28 year old returning to the UFC we're going to be able to see in my opinion where he's at because if he goes out there and he has a, a subpar performance against Hirota we can assume that he's, he might end up getting cut like within the next couple of fights but then if he goes out there and steamrolls Hirota it's completely the opposite end of the spectrum and we're going to be thinking okay well yeah he's just took out a guy that's been around for years and you know a veteran of the sport I know Hirota was never sort of like top 15 caliber but he's still a guy that's a veteran and has, has been around the game for a long time yeah, it's invaluable experience so whether you're, you're the gauge of these uh new fighters coming in or whether you're the guy that delivers the veteran lesson to the new guys i think they play a really vital part in this sport in in regards to um improving fighters and changing direction and uh, making them think differently and ultimately just evolving the sport and let's not forget these new guys that are getting taught the veteran lesson or are getting put in with the veteran to gauge where they're at they're one day going to be that guy that's giving a veteran lesson out and being the gauge for another younger guy. You know, it's yeah. it's a constant flow. So I, I love it. I love the mix of veterans and new waves. And I think the, the main event for this fight is the exact case of that. You've got Dos, like we've already mentioned, Dos Santos that's been around for years, been in there with the best, faced the best, seen it all inside the cage. There'll be nothing that Taito Ivasa throws at. Uh, Dos Santos over 25 minutes that he hasn't seen or had to deal with in his career um, but then in return Taito Ivasa is going to be able to take so much from a guy that's like I've just said seen everything and been in there in every scenario so yeah, yeah. I, I I really really like the mix of, of veteran and uh, new waves to an extent the one type of mix that I don't want and I did touch upon it uh, breaking it down is someone like Tyson Pedro and Shogun which we're going to move on to in, the, in, in just a minute and talk about um uh, talk about matchmaking but yeah that's the type of veteran and new wave fighter that i don't really like to see because i do think shogun's had enough that knockout from anthony smith was brutal and i think we're gonna see another brutal knockout and like i say it's just not it's not nice to see when you know it's coming with anthony mm. smith i gave shogun every chance of winning that fight i thought um i think i might have picked smith to win but i, I did say it was going to be close and i did give shogun a uh, heavy path to victory but 
he just got steamrolled and when you watch that and now he's fighting Tyson Pedro who I think is arguably a better fighter than Anthony Smith um, yeah I just don't like it for him no but then that moves us on to the second hot topic so um, yeah I'm just going to talk about matchmaking because this card has got some great matchmaking, but it's also got some questionable matchmaking as well. Um, so the great matchmaking for me, like I've already mentioned, Jake Matthews and Tony Martin, what a fight that is. It's so <laughs> well matched. I can't put into words how great it is. Um, it, it's just, it's almost like last week with, uh, sorry, not last week, the week before with um, Michel Prezeres and Bartos Fabinski. Like, how yeah. good, like, pissed me off that they matched those two guys. And by the way, that fucking ended completely the way <laughs> I didn't think it was going to end. Um, and it, it made me even more pissed off because I wanted to see three rounds, you know. <laughs> they didn't answer any of my questions that I had. I wanted, I wanted my questions to be answered and they just weren't. Instead, I got, a, you know, we got a brutal, really quick knockout, which people were like, oh, man, why are you complaining about that? But I was so intrigued and so um, so invested uh, mentally and emotionally in that fight that I just wanted <laughs> to see three rounds. I wanted to see what was up, man, and uh, we couldn't get it. But this fight is almost like that with Tony Martin and Jake Matthews. I think it's a fantastic fight. It's one that I'm going to be really intrigued with. And if you ask me which fight I'm most looking forward to on the card, it's probably going to be that just because they match up so well. But then you've got the flip side, which again, I've just mentioned and I've mentioned about 50 times on this podcast already. You've got Tyson Pedro and Shogun, which in my opinion shouldn't be fighting. So uh, the question to you, John, is do you think uh, the UFC as a whole do uh, a good job with the matchmaking or do you think there's so there's too many questionable um, que- questionable fights matched together that sort of deters you from saying as a whole it's it's very good. Um, ultimately, I I think the matchmaking is pretty good. Um, I, I, I do think they uh, they more often than not they put together good fights, um, good stylistic fights, and fights that generally make sense from. Um, from a rankings perspective, um, but yeah, they do then sometimes shoot themselves in the foot by throwing out these uh, the, these odd fights that you you look at and think, well, why match him up against him? And um, I can't I, the name escapes me, but we mentioned it in either last week or the week before's podcast. There was a guy who. Um, he won two or three on the, the bounce and then he was fighting against a, a newcomer who was coming in um, and, uh, and he was making his UFC debut and we, we just kind of looked at it like this is a massive step backwards. I don't I know if th- there's been a couple of those. I don't know if this is the one you're thinking of, but the one that springs to my mind is Vicente Luque and Jalen Turner. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could well have been that, yeah. Yeah, because we're like, well, why? <laughs> why kind of thing? He, he, he's on the verge of like top 15 in the division and he's beaten some very dangerous guys and guys that have been around the UFC for a long time. And then you're just bringing in a complete newcomer who you don't know how they're going to fare in, um, against you, UFC caliber opposition. And I'm not saying that you can't ever do that because sometimes there are guys that are just awesome that come in from, from what seems to be nowhere. We, we saw that with, um, with Alex Hernandez, um, he came in and defeated uh, Dariush, and people were like, "Well, who's Hernandez?" I'll be honest, I hadn't heard of him before he came into the UFC. I hadn't seen anything about him until I looked up his uh, his record and things before the fight. Um, so on occasions, it, it it does work, and and afterwards, like we always say, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Afterwards, you think, "Oh yeah, that was that was a good bit of matchmaking. They've uh, they've escalated this this young kid to." Um, propelled him into a, a, a decent spot in the rankings early on, but but yeah, they do throw the odd curveball, and, and then there's also fights like um, like we see with the, the Ped, Pedro uh, Tyson Pedro and, and Shogun, who are a fight that you just think sometimes they're, they're throwing the uh, the lamb to the slaughter, so to speak. And I'm, I'm not saying it in a disrespectful way to Shogun, because like we we covered earlier, he, he's a legend of the sport and a, a guy that I absolutely love, one of my favourite ever fighters, but. Um, at times like this, surely fans can see it and fans know about it and, and say, like, if if he, if they're insistent on 
continuing to fight. Don't put them up against young, up and hung, uh, hungry, young, up and coming um, athletic fighters. Match them against someone else who's on the decline in their career. Like the fight with uh, Shogun and uh, John Volante. I, I know Volante isn't coming towards the end of his career particularly, but he's a guy that um, he's not a world beater. I don't think he's ever going to challenge in the, the top 10 of the division. Um, fights like that make sense. And and I don't mind fights like that as much if, if someone like Shogun isn't going to retire and he's going to carry on fighting. Match him up against someone of a similar ilk who, who's getting on now and they're very close to retirement. And um, and yeah, that, don't throw them to slaughter against a, a young up-and-comer and, uh, and just let them take more unnecessary damage. But uh, going back to your original point, ultimately I think the matchmaking is more often than not um, very good on this fight uh, on this card I'm looking forward to the uh, the Matthews and Martin fight like you said I'm also really looking forward to the um, I know it's a late notice fight but the uh, Alas Garcia and uh, Kai yeah, fight I think that'll be uh, I think that'll be a great fight as well so uh, I also think the uh, the Wilson Hayes and uh, Ben Ten fight's a, a good stylistic matchup um, a it's good, a good stylistic a good fight, matchup yeah. but I feel that whoever wins in that fight will will win comfortably. I think one style will yeah. outshine the other. Whereas like with Jake Matthews and Tony Martin, I think the styles yeah, it will could clash. Go either way, yeah. So yeah. um but yeah, like moving moving on to the um sorry, moving back to what you mentioned with, with Anthony Smith and Shogun, you know. Like that fight was okay to make. It was dangerous for Shogun. We knew it was dangerous for Shogun. But, yeah. Um we were under no um we, we had no real concerns that Shogun's chin was definitely gone. But then he got knocked out brutally, and you think yeah. to yourself, okay, it happened. That's fine. That happens in this sport. He got knocked out brutally, and he'll probably not be the same again uh, due to his age and the, the amount of wars that he's been in for us MMA fans. So then at that point, I agree with you. You start matching him against somebody that maybe doesn't have brutal knockout power, that isn't as young, just so we can extend the career of, of the fighter a little bit to give the fans a little bit more of the legend before he inevitably goes off the scene. Yeah. You don't throw him in against someone like Tyson Pedro, <laughs> who's bigger, stronger, more athletic, um, in his fucking home country, you know. Yeah. You're making show you making Shogun travel to Australia for this. Like yeah. it's just it's just such a bad fight. Um and do you know what I hope I fucking hope that I eat my words. I hope you eat your words. I hope everybody yeah, eats their words and Shogun's at, Shogun comes out and wins this fight. Like, I would love nothing better than Shogun to win this fight, but I just, I, I, I cannot see it. For me as a whole, I do like the matchmaking. Now, the one thing from, from my perspective, and people will always say, oh, you're always looking at stuff from, from a gambler's point of view, from a betting point of view, rather than from uh, a fan point of view. Like, as soon as I see a fight announcement, I'm instantly thinking of who, who I can win money on. I'm a fucking gambler, man. Like, <laughs> of course, that's my that that's my wave of thinking. That's the first thing I'm going to think about. Yes, I'm a fan as well. Of course, I'm a fan of the sport. I, I've... I've if I didn't gamble, I would still watch every UFC. I would still stay up early hours in the morning to watch every UFC. But yeah. first and foremost, man, like the, the gambling stuff is is where I make my money. And of course, that's where I'm going to be thinking. So from a gambling perspective, with these matchups, I sometimes, th well, I'm thinking that um, there is, uh, the, the game evolves, the gambling game evolves, MMA evolves, the, the, they go hand in hand together. I think that there's some there's too many fights nowadays that are having fighters lined minus five hundred, minus six hundred, minus seven hundred. Yeah, yeah. In the sport as volatile as MMA, lines shouldn't be that high. Um but the reason why they are is because I think that the UFC is matching um a fighter against another fighter that's got yeah. an obvious not an obvious but has got a clear winner with a great path to victory i think is the right terminology to use um they, they tend to they tend to not just build up the guys that they think's 
potentially going to be prospects, but they're really giving some guys some softballs. And that, for me, causes like huge wide lines. And yeah. if you look back to a year ago, so 12 months ago, all the lines were really close. They were always really close. You would very, Honestly, you would very rarely see a fighter at sort of like minus 400, minus 500. It'd be a bit of a surprise when you saw the lines drop, a fighter being minus 500. You'd think, oh, fucking hell, fighters that high, that wide, you know. <laughs> Now you're looking at every single time the the odds drop, you're looking at at least like two, three, four of those sort of lines. So um, from a matchmaking point of view, I think from the betting perspective, I don't like it. But from a fan perspective, you know, take my gambling cap off, put my fan cap on. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, there is some great fights and Sean, Sean Shelby and uh, McMaynard do a good job. Obviously, they don't look at it from a gambling perspective perspective at all that that won't cross the mind not even for a second they'll just match up who they think is going to provide an exciting fight it's just unfortunate that a lot of these times especially now um the the line the betting lines are so wide and maybe it's not them maybe it's just the books just becoming just getting better you know just yeah. understanding the sport more and yeah uh, and 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 just them evolving as well you know so as a whole i like the matchmaking um, the, it's very rare where uh, I'll see a fight announcement on Twitter and I won't retweet it and you know say how good the fight is and I don't do that just for the sake of doing that. There's fights that I see and I think oh, no, I'm not bothered about that and I'll just leave it. I won't retweet something that um, that I don't think is relevant. Like genuinely, a lot of these fights I, I really like. So from yeah. from a fan perspective, I really like the matchmaking. From a gambling perspective. I think it could be better, but then I'm just greedy and I want these I want these closer lines rather than really wide lines. So then we move on to our third topic, which, as we've done in previous weeks, we'll discuss the fights that could earn fight of the night bonus, performance of the night bonus. So, John, what have you got? Um, yeah, for me, I think... Um... I think fight of the night could go to uh, one we've mentioned quite a lot, Jay Matthews and Tony Martin. Uh, I think that's got the potential to be a really exciting fight. Um, I think it can be a three-round war, back and forth, going to be very close. Uh, like you say, stylistically, it's a very close matchup. So I definitely think that can win. Um, can win fight of the night, performance of the night bonuses. Um, uh, <laughs> I think Pedro will win one. Um, I think, unfortunately, yeah, he does finish Shogun. I'm, in my uh, prediction, I, I I said they'd drop him and then get a submission. If, if that's the case, then uh, that frees up the um, the uh, the performance of the night bonus to go to uh, to Mark Hunt, who I think uh, puts Willis away with, uh, like we mentioned again earlier, one of his trademark walk-off KOs. And, uh, yeah, that's the uh, the trio of bonuses for me. Yeah, I'm going with, uh, with with similar ones as well. I think the fight of the night is going to be Jake Matthews and Tony Martin. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of fun scrambles. I think uh, I think they could both potentially get dropped or at least one of them get dropped at some point in the fight as well, but then quickly recover and we're all like, oh, this is a great fight. So, yeah, I, I can see that being a, a really high, um, high fast-paced, volumed fight. So, wherever it be standing up or, or, or going down to the mat. So, I've got that for fight of the night. Now, for the performance of the night, I'm torn between three. So I think if Mark Hunt does get a walk-off knockout, I think he's definitely going to get that bonus yeah. 100%. Um, depending on how brutal Tyson Pedro knocks out Shogun in the point, to the point of we're just like disgusted of how bad it is, <laughs> um, that will also get performance of the night but the other one in the mix for me and it does depend on the 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 type of knockouts pedro and hunt score if those were to score the knockouts that we think they will um is soddy yusuf because i think yusuf yeah. is gonna put um it's just gonna put a, a, a huge beat in on mokhtarian i think he's could potentially knock him out as well i just think he's gonna style on him um and it, again if i'm right in that and he does score a brutal knockout then soddy will be in the mix of those uh, of, of Pedro and Hunt, but one hundred percent guaranteed. If Pedro scores a brutal knockout and Mark Hunt scores a brutal knockout, they're both going to end up walking away with the bonus because the, yep. the the Mark Hunt's the co-main event on his retirement fight, fighting at home, and Pedro's the fighter fighting at home, um, third fight from from the end on the yep. main card. So, they're my predictions for. 
fight of the night and performance of the night. And that's the lot for this week's podcast, guys. So if you like the podcast, please hit the like button, subscribe as well. We've still got so much content coming in the run up to Christmas, so you won't miss out if you subscribe to any of that content. For the bets this week at UFC Adelaide and Tough 28 finale, don't forget to check out the premium bets from Newsom MMA and the membership options available too. Never hesitate to contact me if you've got any questions or inquiries. So, John, before we hit the Newsom MMA two-minute plug, what have you got to mention, man? Uh, yeah, as always, um, check out my work on uh, on Fight Post, either um, Fight Post MMA on Facebook or www.fightpost.co.uk, um, or hit me up on Twitter at MMA and Me. Um, I'm always looking to talk fights and uh, talk anything MMA related. So the more people that want to get involved, the merrier. So yeah, um, follow me, and I'll I'll always make sure that I follow back, and uh, and yeah, we can just get talking some fights. Awesome, man. Now for the quick Newsom MMA two-minute plug. First of all, I'd like to talk about Concussion Pro One, who are partnering Newsom MMA. Concussion Pro One is the world's first dedicated concussion supplement supporting brain health and performance. This product is honestly groundbreaking and there isn't another supplement like it on the market. The unique formula that makes up Concussion Pro One has been developed and created by some of the world's most decorated sports scientists to help protect and support the brain and its performance. It's approved by the UK Mixed Martial Arts Federation and Concussion Pro One provides some amazing support to the brain it increases mental performance fast recovery from injury reduced inflammation post impacts improved neural protection and much more with professional athletes such as alexander rakic mark diakese and scott Askham using concussion pro one you can also already see how vital this product is not only for mma but for all combat sports find out more information by clicking on any of the banners on the newsome mma website or go to concussionpro1.com secondly please check out the sponsor of newsome mma which is cbd life uk i'm a great case study for cbd in the MMA gambling world, people often talk about sweats and nerves as they're watching the fight that they've bet on fight these feelings are real and because of this i vape cbd to help relax me on fight night i didn't think it would make much of a difference but it really does and i would honestly recommend it to anybody you can access the offers from my sponsorship by clicking on any of the banners on the newsome mma website and you can also get 15 percent off your first order by using promo code newsome mma and that's it from us guys enjoy the fights on friday and saturday night thank you and goodbye Thank you very much. Enjoy.